It was raining when she came out of the building, and the sky was a dull putty color. The soldiers on the square had taken shelter in their huts, and the streets were deserted. There was no vehicle in sight, and she knew she would have to walk the long way home. The brandy glow faded as she trudged along. The cold wind made her shiver, and the chilly needle-like drops drove hard into her face. The rain quickly penetrated Aunt Pity's thin cloak until it hung in clammy folds about her. She knew the velvet dress was being ruined, and as for the tail feathers on the bonnet, they were as drooping and draggled as when their former owner had worn them about the wet barnyard of Tara. The bricks of the sidewalk were broken, and for long stretches completely gone. In these spots the mud was ankle-deep, and her slippers stuck in it as if it were glue, even coming completely off her feet. Every time she bent over to retrieve them, the hem of the dress fell in the mud. She didn't even try to avoid puddles, but stepped dully into them, dragging her heavy skirts after her. She could feel her wet petticoat and pantalettes cold about her ankles, but she was beyond caring about the wreck of the costume on which she had gambled so much. She was chilled and disheartened and desperate. How could she ever go back to Terra and face them after her brave words? How could she tell them they must all go somewhere? How could she leave it all? The red fields, the tall pines, the dark swampy bottom lands, the quiet burying ground where Ellen lay in the cedar's deep shade. Hatred of Rhett burned in her heart as she plodded along the slippery way. What a blackguard he was! She hoped they did hang him so she would never have to face him again with his knowledge of her disgrace and her humiliation. Of course, he could have gotten the money for her if he'd wanted to get it. Oh, hanging was too good for him. Thank God he couldn't see her now, with her clothes soaking wet and her hair straggling and her teeth chattering. How hideous she must look, and how he would laugh. The Negroes she passed turned insolent grins at her and laughed among themselves as she hurried by, slipping and sliding in the mud, stopping, panting to replace her slippers. How dared they laugh, the black apes! How dared they grin at her, Scarlet O'Hara of Tara! She'd like to have them all whipped until the blood ran down their backs. What devils the Yankees were to set them free, free to jeer at white people. As she walked down Washington Street, the landscape was as dreary as her own heart. Here there was none of the bustle and cheerfulness which she had noted on Peachtree Street. Here many handsome homes had once stood, but few of them had been rebuilt. Smoked foundations and the lonesome blackened chimneys, now known as... Sherman's sentinels appeared with disheartening frequency. Overgrown paths led to what had been houses, old lawns thick with dead weeds, carriage blocks bearing names she knew so well, hitching posts which would never again know the knot of rains, cold wind and rain, mud and bare trees, silence and desolation. How wet her feet were, and how long the journey home. She heard the splash of hooves behind her and moved farther over on the narrow sidewalk to avoid more mud splotches on Aunt Pittypat's cloak. A horse and buggy came slowly up the road and she turned to watch it, determined to beg a ride if the driver was a white person. The rain obscured her vision as the buggy came abreast, but she saw the driver peer over the tarpaulin that stretched from the dashboard to his chin. There was something familiar about his face as she stepped out into the road to get a closer view. There was an embarrassed little cough from the man, and a well-known voice cried in accents of pleasure and astonishment. Surely it can't be Miss Scarlet. Oh, Mr. Kennedy, she cried, 
splashing across the road and leaning on the muddy wheel, heedless of further damage to the cloak. I was never so glad to see anybody in my life. He colored with pleasure at the obvious sincerity of her words, hastily squirted a stream of tobacco juice from the opposite side of the buggy, and leaped spryly to the ground. He shook her hand enthusiastically, and holding up the tarpaulin, assisted her into the buggy. Miss Scarlet, what are you doing over in this section by yourself? Don't you know it's dangerous these days? And you're soaking wet. Here, wrap the robe around your feet. As he fussed over her, clucking like a hen, she gave herself up to the luxury of being taken care of. It was nice to have a man fussing and clucking and scolding, even if it was only that old maid in pants, Frank Kennedy. It was especially soothing after Rhett's brutal treatment. And oh, how good to see a county face when she was so far from home. He was well-dressed, she noticed, and the buggy was new, too. The horse looked young and well-fed, but Frank looked far older than his years. Older than on that Christmas Eve when he had been at Tara with his men. He was thin and sallow-faced, and his yellow eyes were watery and sunken in creases of loose flesh. His ginger-colored beard was scantier than ever, streaked with tobacco juice, and as ragged as if he clawed at it incessantly. But he looked bright and cheerful, in contrast with the lines of sorrow and worry and weariness which Scarlet saw in faces everywhere. "'It's a pleasure to see you,' said Frank warmly. "'I didn't know you were in town.' I saw Miss Pittypat only last week, and she didn't tell me you were coming. Did, uh, um, did anyone else come up from Tara with you? He was thinking of Sue Ellen, the silly old fool. No, she said, wrapping the warm lap robe about her and trying to pull it up around her neck. I came alone. I didn't give Aunt Pity any warning. He chirruped to the horse and it plodded off, picking its way carefully down the slick road. All the folks at Tara well? Oh, yes, so-so. She must think of something to talk about, yet it was so hard to talk. Her mind was leaden with defeat, and all she wanted was to lie back in this warm blanket and say to herself, I won't think of Tara now. I'll think of it later when it won't hurt so much. If she could just get him started talking on some subject which would hold him all the way home, so she would have nothing to do but murmur, how nice, and you certainly are smart, at intervals. Mr. Kennedy, I'm so surprised to see you. I know I've been a bad girl not keeping up with old friends, but I didn't know you were here in Atlanta. I thought somebody told me you were in Marietta. I do business in Marietta, a lot of business, he said. Didn't Miss Sue Ellen tell you I'd settled in Atlanta? Didn't she tell you about my store? Vaguely, she had a memory of Sue Ellen chattering about Frank and his store, but she never paid much heed to anything Sue Ellen said. It had been sufficient to know that Frank was alive and would some day take Sue Ellen off her hands. No, not a word, she lied. Have you a store? How smart you must be! He looked a little hurt at hearing that Sue Ellen had not published the news, but brightened at the flattery. Yes, I've got a store, and a pretty good one, I think. Folks tell me I'm a born merchant. He laughed pleasedly, the tittery, crackling laugh which she always found so annoying. Conceited old fool, she thought. Oh, you could be a success at anything you turned your hand to, Mr. Kennedy. But how on earth did you ever get started with a store? When I saw you Christmas before last, you said you didn't have a sit in the world. He cleared his throat raspingly, clawed at his whiskers, and smiled his nervous, timid smile. Well, it's a long story, Miss Scarlet. Thank the Lord, she thought. Perhaps it will hold him till we get home. 
and aloud, Do tell. You recall when we came to Terra last, hunting for supplies? Well, not long after that, I went into active service. I mean, real fighting. No more commissary for me. There wasn't much need for a commissary, Miss Scarlet, because we couldn't hardly pick up a thing for the army, and I thought the place for an able-bodied man was in the fighting line. Well, I fought along with the cavalry for a spell till I got a mini-ball through the shoulder. He looked very proud, and Scarlet said, How dreadful! Oh, it wasn't so bad, just a flesh wound, he said deprecatingly. I was sent down south to a hospital, and when I was just about well, the Yankee raiders came through. My, my, but that was a hot time. We didn't have much warning, and all of us who could walk helped haul out the army stores and the hospital equipment to the train tracks to move it. We'd gotten one train about loaded when the Yankees rode in one end of town, and out we went the other end as fast as we could go. My, my, that was a mighty sad sight, sitting on top of that train and seeing the Yankees burn those supplies we had to leave at the depot. Miss Scarlet, they burned about a half mile of stuff we had piled up there along the tracks. We just did get away ourselves. How dreadful. Yes, that's the word, dreadful. Our men had come back into Atlanta then, and so our train was sent here. Well, Miss Scarlet, it wasn't long before the war was over, and, well, there was a lot of china and carts and mattresses and blankets and nobody claiming them. I suppose rightfully they belonged to the Yankees. I think those were the terms of the surrender, weren't they? Um, said Scarlet absently. She was getting warmer now and a little drowsy. I don't know till now if I did right, he said a little querulously. But the way I figured it, all that stuff wouldn't do the Yankees a bit of good. They'd probably burn it. And our folks had paid good solid money for it. And I thought it still ought to belong to the Confederacy or to the Confederates. Do you see what I mean? Um, I'm glad you agree with me, Miss Scarlet. In a way, it's been on my conscience. Lots of folks have told me, oh, forget about it, Frank, but I can't. I couldn't hold up my head if I thought I'd done what wasn't right. Do you think I did right? Of course, she said, wondering what the old fool had been talking about. Some struggle with his conscience. When a man got as old as Frank Kennedy, he ought to have learned not to bother about things that didn't matter. But he was always so nervous and fussy and old maidish. I'm glad to hear you say it. After the surrender, I had about ten dollars in silver and nothing else in the world. You know what they did to Jonesboro and my house and store there. I just didn't know what to do. But I used the ten dollars to put a roof on an old store down by five points, and I moved the hospital equipment in and started selling it. Everybody needed beds and china and mattresses, and I sold them cheap, because I figured it was about as much other folks' stuff as it was mine. But I cleared money on it and bought some more stuff, and the store just went along fine. I think I'll make a lot of money on it if things pick up. At the word money, her mind came back to him, crystal clear. You say you made money? He visibly expanded under her interest. Few women except Sue Ellen had ever given him more than perfunctory courtesy, and it was very flattering to have a former belle like Scarlet hanging on his words. He slowed the horse so they wouldn't reach home before he had finished his story. I'm not a millionaire, Miss Scarlet, and considering the money I used to have, what I've got now sounds small. But I made a thousand dollars this year. Of course, five hundred of it went to paying for new stock and repairing the store and paying the rent. But I've made five hundred clear, and as things are certainly picking up, I ought to clear two thousand next year. I sure can use it, too, for you see, I've got another iron in the fire. 
interest had sprung up sharply in her at the talk of money. She veiled her eyes with thick, bristly lashes and moved a little closer to him. What does that mean, Mr. Kennedy? He laughed and slapped the reins against the horse's back. I guess I'm boring you talking about business, Miss Scarlet. A pretty little woman like you doesn't need to know anything about business. The old fool. Oh, I know I'm a goose about business, but I'm so interested. Please tell me all about it, and you can explain what I don't understand. Well, my other iron is a sawmill. A what? A mill to cut up lumber and plane it. I haven't bought it yet, but I'm going to. There's a man named Johnson who has one way out Peachtree Road, and he's anxious to sell it. He needs some cash right away, so he wants to sell and stay and run it for me at a weekly wage. It's one of the few mills in this section, Miss Scarlet. The Yankees destroyed most of them. And anyone who owns a sawmill owns a gold mine, for nowadays you can ask your own price for lumber. The Yankees burned so many houses here, and there aren't enough for people to live in, and it looks like folks have gone crazy about rebuilding. They can't get enough lumber, and they can't get it fast enough. People are just pouring into Atlanta now. All the folks from the country districts who can't make a go of farming without darkies. And the Yankees and carpetbaggers who are swarming in trying to pick our bones a little better than they already are. I tell you, Atlanta's going to be a big town soon. They've got to have lumber for their houses. So I'm going to buy this mill just as soon as, well, as soon as some of the bills owing me are paid. By this time next year... I ought to be breathing easy about money. I... I guess you know why I'm so anxious to make money quickly, don't you? He blushed and cackled again. He's thinking of Sue Ellen, Scarlet thought in disgust. For a moment she considered asking him to lend her three hundred dollars, but wearily she rejected the idea. He would be embarrassed. He would stammer. He would offer excuses, but he wouldn't lend it to her. He had worked hard for it, so he could marry Sue Ellen in the spring. And if he parted with it, his wedding would be postponed indefinitely. Even if she worked on his sympathies and his duty toward his future family and gained his promise of a loan, she knew Sue Ellen would never permit it. Sue Ellen was getting more and more worried over the fact that she was practically an old maid and she would move heaven and earth to prevent anything from delaying her marriage. What was there in that whining, complaining girl to make this old fool so anxious to give her a soft nest? Sue Ellen didn't deserve a loving husband, and the profits of a store and a sawmill. The minute Sue got her hands on a little money, she'd give herself unendurable airs, and never contribute one cent toward the upkeep of terror, not Sue Ellen. She'd think herself well out of it, and not care if Tara went for taxes or burned to the ground, so long as she had pretty clothes and a missus in front of her name. As Scarlet thought of Sue Ellen's secure future and the precarious one of herself and Tara, anger flamed in her at the unfairness of life. Hastily she looked out of the buggy into the muddy street lest Frank should see her expression. She was going to lose everything she had while Sue... Suddenly, a determination was born in her. Sue Ellen should not have Frank and his store and his mill. Sue Ellen didn't deserve them. She was going to have them herself. She thought of Tara and remembered Jonas Wilkerson venomous as a rattler, at the foot of the front steps, and she grasped at the last straw floating above the shipwreck of her life. Rhett had failed her, but the Lord had provided Frank. But how can I get him? Her fingers clenched as she looked unseeingly into the rain. Can I make him forget Sue and propose to me real quick? If I could make Rhett almost propose, I know I could get Frank. 
Her eyes went over him, her lids flickering. Certainly, he's no beauty, she thought coolly. And he's got very bad teeth, and his breath smells bad, and he's old enough to be my father. Moreover, he's nervous and timid and well-meaning. And I don't know of any more damning qualities a man can have. But at least he's a gentleman. And I believe I could stand living with him better than with Rhett. Certainly I could manage him easier. At any rate, beggars can't be choosers. That he was Sue Ellen's fiancé caused her no qualm of conscience. After the complete moral collapse which had sent her to Atlanta and to Rhett, the appropriation of her sister's betrothed seemed a minor affair, and one not to be bothered with at this time. With the rousing of fresh hope, her spine stiffened, and she forgot that her feet were wet and cold. She looked at Frank so steadily, her eyes narrowing, that he became somewhat alarmed, and she dropped her gaze swiftly, remembering Rhett's words. I've seen eyes like yours above a dueling pistol. They evoke no ardor in the male breast. What's the matter, Miss Scarlet? You got a chill? Yes. She answered helplessly. Would you mind? She hesitated timidly. Would you mind if I put my hand in your coat pocket? It's so cold, and my muff is soaked through. Why, why, of course not. And you haven't any gloves. My, my, what a brute I've been idling along like this, talking my head off when you must be freezing and wanting to get to a fire. Get up, Sally. By the way, Miss Scarlet, I've been so busy talking about myself, I haven't even asked what you were doing in this section in this weather. I was at the Yankee headquarters, she answered before she thought. His sandy brows went up in astonishment. But, Miss Scarlet, the soldiers... Why? Mary, Mother of God, let me think of a real good lie, she prayed hastily. It would never do for Frank to suspect she had seen Rhett. Frank thought Rhett the blackest of blackguards and unsafe for decent women to speak to. I went there. I went there to see if, if any of the officers would buy fancy work from me to send home to their wives. I embroider very nicely. He sank back against the seat aghast, indignation struggling with bewilderment. You went to the Yankees? But, Miss Scarlet, you shouldn't. Why? Why, surely your father doesn't know. Surely, Miss Pittypat. Oh, I shall die if you tell Aunt Pittypat. She cried in real anxiety and burst into tears. It was easy to cry because she was so cold and miserable. But the effect was startling. Frank couldn't have been more embarrassed or helpless if she had suddenly begun disrobing. He clicked his tongue against his teeth several times, muttering, Ma, Ma, and made futile gestures at her. A daring thought went through his mind that he should draw her head onto his shoulder and pat her. But he had never done this to any woman and hardly knew how to go about it. Scarlet O'Hara, so high-spirited and pretty, crying here in his buggy? Scarlet O'Hara, the proudest of the proud, trying to sell needlework to the Yankees. His heart burned. She sobbed on, saying a few words now and then, and he gathered that all was not well at Tara. Mr. O'Hara was still not himself at all, and there wasn't enough food to go around for so many. So she had to come to Atlanta to try to make a little money for herself and her boy. Frank clicked his tongue again, and suddenly he found that her head was on his shoulder. He didn't quite know how it got there. Surely he had not placed it there. But there her head was, and there was Scarlet, helplessly sobbing against his thin chest, an exciting and novel sensation for him. He patted her shoulder timidly, gingerly at first, 
and when she didn't rebuff him, he became bolder and patted her firmly. What a helpless, sweet, womanly little thing she was, and how brave and silly to try her hand at making money by her needle. But dealing with the Yankees, that was too much. I won't tell Miss Pity Pat, but you must promise me, Miss Scarlet, that you won't do anything like this again. The idea of your father's daughter. Her wet green eyes sought his helplessly. But, Mr. Kennedy, I must do something. I must take care of my poor little boy. And there's no one to look after us now. You are a brave little woman, he pronounced. But I won't have you do this sort of thing. Your family would die of shame. Then what will I do? The swimming eyes looked up to him as if she knew he knew everything and was hanging on his words. Well, I don't know right now. But I'll think of something. Oh, I know you will. You're so smart. Frank. She had never called him by his first name before. And the sound came to him as a pleasant shock and surprise. The poor girl was probably so upset she didn't even notice her slip. He felt very kindly toward her and very protecting. If there was anything he could do for Sue Ellen O'Hara's sister, he would certainly do it. He pulled out a red bandana handkerchief and handed it to her, and she wiped her eyes and began to smile tremulously. I'm such a silly little goose, she said apologetically. Please forgive me. You are a silly little goose. You're a very brave little woman, and you are trying to carry too heavy a load. I'm afraid Miss Pittypad isn't going to be much help to you. I hear she lost most of her property, and Mr. Henry Hamilton's in bad shape himself. I only wish I had a home to offer you shelter in. But, Miss Scarlet, you just remember this. When Miss Sue Ellen and I are married, there'll always be a place for you under our roof, and for Wade Hampton, too. Now was the time. Surely the saints and angels watched over her to give her such a heaven-sent opportunity. She managed to look very startled and embarrassed and opened her mouth as if to speak quickly and then shut it with a pop. Don't tell me you didn't know I was to be your brother-in-law this spring, he said with nervous jocularity. And then... Seeing her eyes fill up with tears, he questioned in alarm. What's the matter? Miss Sue's not ill, is she? Oh, no, no. There is something wrong, you must tell me. Oh, I can't. I didn't know. I thought surely she must have written you. Oh, how mean. Miss Scarlet, what is it? Oh, Frank. I didn't mean to let it out, but I thought, of course, you knew that she'd written you. Written me what? He was trembling. Oh, to do this to a fine man like you. What's she done? She didn't write you? Oh, I guess she was too ashamed to write you. She should be ashamed. Oh, to have such a mean sister. By this time... Frank could not even get questions to his lips. He sat staring at her, grey-faced, the reins slack in his hands. She's going to marry Tony Fontaine next month. Oh, I'm sorry, Frank. So sorry to be the one to tell you. She just got tired of waiting, and she was afraid she'd be an old maid. Mammy was standing on the front porch when Frank helped Scarlet out of the buggy. She had evidently been standing there for some time, for her head rag was damp and the old shawl clutched tightly about her showed rain spots. Her wrinkled black face was a study in anger and apprehension, 
and her lip was pushed out farther than Scarlet could ever remember. She peered quickly at Frank, and when she saw who it was, her face changed. Pleasure, bewilderment, and something akin to guilt spreading over it. She waddled forward to Frank with pleased greetings and grinned and curtsied when he shook her hand. It sure is good to see home folks, she said. How is you, Mr. Frank? My, ain't you looking fine and grand. If an I'd knowed Miss Scarlet was out with you, I wouldn't worried so. I'd knowed she was taken care of. I come back here and find she gone, and I'd been as distracted as a chicken with its head off, thinking she running round this town by herself with all these trashy free issue niggers on the street. How come you didn't tell me you'd gone out, honey? And you with a cold. Scarlet winked slyly at Frank, and for all his distress at the bad news he had just heard, he smiled, knowing she was enjoining silence, and making him one in a pleasant conspiracy. You run up and fix me some dry clothes, Mammy, she said, and some hot tea. Lord, your new dress is plum ruined, grumbled Mammy. I want to have a time drying it and brushing it, so it'll be fit to be worn to the wedding tonight. She went into the house, and Scarlet leaned close to Frank and whispered, Do come to supper tonight. We're so lonesome. And we're going to the wedding afterward. Do be our escort. And please don't say anything to Aunt Pity about... about Sue Ellen. It would distress her so much... And I can't bear for her to know that my sister... Oh, I won't. I won't, Frank said hastily, wincing from the very thought. You've been so sweet to me today, and done me so much good. I feel right brave again. She squeezed his hand in parting, and turned the full battery of her eyes upon him. Mammy who was waiting just inside the door, gave her an inscrutable look and followed her, puffing, up the stairs to the bedroom. She was silent while she stripped off the wet clothes and hung them over chairs and tucked Scarlet into bed. When she had brought up a cup of hot tea and a hot brick rolled in flannel, she looked down at Scarlet and said, with the nearest approach to an apology in her voice Scarlet had ever heard, Lamb, how come you didn't tell your own mammy what you was up to? Then I wouldn't have had to traipse all this way up here to Atlanta. I was too old and too fat for such running round. What do you mean? Honey, you can't fool me. I knows you. And I seed Mr. Frank's face just now, and I seed your face, and I can read your mind like a Parson read a Bible. And I heard that whispering you was giving him about Miss Sue Ellen. And if an odd notion twas Mr. Frank you was after, I'd have stayed home where I belongs. Well, said Scarlet shortly, snuggling under the blankets and realizing it was useless to try to throw Mammy off the scent. Who did you think it was? Chow. I didn't know, but I didn't like the look on your face yesterday. And I remembered Miss Pittypat writing Miss Melly that the rapscallion butler man had lots of money, and I don't forget what I hears. But Mr. Frank, he a gentleman, even if he ain't so pretty. Scarlet gave her a sharp look, and Mammy returned the gaze with calm omniscience. Well, what are you going to do about it? Tattle to Sue Ellen? I is going to help you pleasure, Mr. Frank, every way I knows how, said Mammy, tucking the covers about Scarlet's neck. Scarlet lay quietly for a while as Mammy fussed about the room, relief flooding her that there was no need for words between them. No explanations were asked, no reproaches made. Mammy understood 
and was silent. In Mammy, Scarlet had found a realist more uncompromising than herself. The mottled wise old eyes saw deeply, saw clearly, with the directness of the savage and the child, undeterred by conscience when danger threatened her pet. Scarlet was her baby, and what her baby wanted, even though it belonged to another, Mammy was willing to help her obtain. The rights of Sue Ellen and Frank Kennedy did not even enter her mind save to cause a grim inward chuckle. Scarlet was in trouble and doing the best she could. And Scarlet was Miss Ellen's child. Mammy rallied to her with never a moment's hesitation. Scarlet felt the silent reinforcement. And as the hot brick at her feet warmed her, the hope which had flickered faintly on the cold ride home grew into a flame. It swept through her, making her heart pump the blood through her veins in pounding surges. Strength was coming back, and a reckless excitement which made her want to laugh aloud. Not beaten yet, she thought exultantly. Hand me the mirror, Mammy, she said. Keep your shoulders under that cover, ordered Mammy, passing the hand mirror to her, a smile on her thick lips. Scarlet looked at herself. I look white as a haunt, she said, and my hair is as wild as a horse's tail. You don't look as pretty as you might. Hmm. Is it raining very hard? You know it's pouring. Well... Just the same, you've got to go downtown for me. Not in this rain, I ain't. Yes, you are, or I'll go myself. What you got to do that won't wait? Look to me like you've done enough for one day. I want, said Scarlet, surveying herself carefully in the mirror, a bottle of cologne water. You can wash my hair and rinse it with cologne and buy me a jar of quincy jelly to make it lie down flat. I ain't gonna wash your hair in this weather, and you ain't gonna put no cologne on your head like a fast woman neither. Not while I got breath in my body. Oh, yes, I am. Look at my purse and get that five-dollar gold piece out and go to town. And, um, Mammy, while you're downtown, you might get me a, a pot of rouge. What death? asked Mammy suspiciously. Scarlet met her eyes with a coldness she was far from feeling. There was never any way of knowing just how far Mammy could be bullied. Never mind. Just ask for it. I ain't buying nothing that I don't know what it is. Well, it's paint, if you're so curious. Face paint. Don't stand there and swell up like a toad. Go on. Paint, ejaculated Mammy. Face paint. Well, you ain't so big that I can't whoop you. I ain't never been so scandalized. You has lost your mind. Miss Ellen be turning in her grave this minute, painting your face like a... You know very well Grandma Robillard painted her face and... Yes, um, and wore only one petticoat... And it rang out with water her make it stick and show the shape of her legs. But that ain't saying you is gonna do something like that. Times was scandalous when old miss was young, but times changes. They do, and... Name of God, cried Scarlet, losing her temper and throwing back the covers. You can go straight back to Tara. You can't send me to Tara unless I wants to go. I's free, said Mammy heatedly. And I's going to stay right here. Get back in that bed. Does you want to catch pneumonia just now? Put down them stays. Put them down, honey. Now, Miss Scarlet, you ain't gone nowheres in this weather. Lord God, but you sure look like you pa. Get back into bed. I can't go buying no paint. I die of shame. 
everybody knowing it was for my child. Miss Scarlet, you is so sweet and pretty looking, you don't need no paint. Okay, don't nobody but bad women's use that stuff. Well, they get results, don't they? Jesus, hear her. Lamb, don't say bad things like that. Put down them wet stockings, honey. I can't have you buy that stuff yourself. Miss Ellen would haunt me. Get back in bed. I'll go. That night at Mrs. Elsing's, when Fanny had been duly married and old Levi and the other musicians were tuning up for the dance, Scarlet looked about her with gladness. It was so exciting to be actually at a party again. She was pleased also with the warm reception she had received. When she entered the house on Frank's arm, everyone had rushed to her with cries of pleasure and welcome, kissed her, shaken her hand, told her they had missed her dreadfully and that she must never go back to Tara. The men seemed gallantly to have forgotten she had tried her best to break their hearts in other days, and the girls that she had done everything in her power to entice their bows away from them. Even Mrs. Merriweather, Mrs. Whiting, Mrs. Mead, and the other dowagers, who had been so cool to her during the last days of the war, forgot her flighty conduct and their disapproval of it, and recalled only that she had suffered in their common defeat, and that she was Pity's niece and Charles's widow. They kissed her and spoke gently with tears in their eyes of her dear mother's passing, and asked at length about her father and her sisters. Everyone asked about Melanie and Ashley, demanding the reason why they, too, had not come back to Atlanta. In spite of her pleasure at the welcome, Scarlet felt a slight uneasiness, which she tried to conceal, an uneasiness about the appearance of her velvet dress. It was still damp to the knees, and still spotted about the hem, despite the frantic efforts of Mammy and Cookie with a steaming kettle, a clean hairbrush, and frantic wavings in front of an open fire. Scarlet was afraid someone would notice her bedraggled state and realize that this was her only nice dress. She was a little cheered by the fact that many of the dresses of the other guests looked far worse than hers. They were so old and had such carefully mended and pressed looks. At least her dress was whole and new, damp though it was. In fact, the only new dress at the gathering, with the exception of Fanny's white satin wedding gown. Remembering what Aunt Pity had told her about the Elsing finances, she wondered where the money for the satin dress had been obtained, and for the refreshments and decorations and musicians, too. It must have cost a pretty penny. Borrowed money, probably, or else the whole Elsing clan had contributed to give Fanny this expensive wedding. Such a wedding in these hard times seemed to Scarlet an extravagance on a par with the tombstones of the Tarleton boys, and she felt the same irritation and lack of sympathy she had felt when she stood in the Tarleton burying ground. The days when money could be thrown away carelessly had passed. Why did these people persist in making the gestures of the old days when the old days were gone? But she shrugged off her momentary annoyance. It wasn't her money, and she didn't want her evening's pleasure spoiled by irritation at other people's foolishness. She discovered she knew the groom quite well, for he was Tommy Welburn from Sparta, and she had nursed him in 1863 when he had a wound in his shoulder. He had been a handsome young six-footer then, and had given up his medical studies to go in the cavalry. Now he looked like a little old man, so bent was he by the wound in his hip. He walked with some difficulty, and as Aunt Pity had remarked, spraddled in a very vulgar way. But he seemed totally unaware of his appearance, or unconcerned about it, and had the manner of one who asks no odds from any man. He had given up all hope of continuing his medical studies, and was now a contractor, working a labor crew of Irishmen who were building the new hotel. 
Scarlet wondered how he managed so onerous a job in his condition, but asked no questions, realizing wryly that almost anything was possible when necessity drove. Tommy and Hugh Elsing and the little monkey-like René Picard stood talking with her while the chairs and furniture were pushed back to the wall in preparation for the dancing. Hugh hadn't changed since Scarlet last saw him in 1862. He was still the thin, sensitive boy with the same lock of pale brown hair hanging over his forehead and the same delicate, useless-looking hand she remembered so well. But René had changed since that furlough when he married Maybelle Merriweather. He still had the Gallic twinkle in his black eyes and the Creole zest for living, but... For all his easy laughter, there was something hard about his face which had not been there in the early days of the war, and the air of supercilious elegance which had clung about him in his striking zouave uniform was completely gone. "'Cheeks like the rose, eyes like the emerald,' he said, kissing Scarlet's hand and paying tribute to the rouge upon her face. Pretty like when I first see you at the bazaar. You remember? Never have I forgot how you tossed your wedding ring in my basket. Ha! But that was brave. But I should never have think you wait so long to get another ring. His eyes sparkled wickedly, and he dug his elbow into Hugh's ribs. And I never thought you'd be driving a pie wagon, Rennie Picard, she said. Instead of being ashamed at having his degrading occupation thrown in his face, he seemed pleased and laughed uproariously, slapping Hugh on the back. Touché, he cried. Belle Mare, Madame Merriweather, she make me do it. The first work I do in all my life, me, René Picard, who was to grow old breeding the racehorse, playing the fiddle. Now I drive the pie wagon and I like it. Madame Belmere, she can make a man do anything. She should have been the general, and we win the war, eh, Tommy? Well, thought Scarlet, the idea of liking to drive a pie wagon when his people used to own ten miles along the Mississippi River and a big house in New Orleans, too. If we'd had our mothers-in-law in the ranks, we'd have beat the Yankees in a week, agreed Tommy, his eyes straying to the slender, indomitable form of his new mother-in-law. The only reason we lasted as long as we did was because of the ladies behind us who wouldn't give up. Who'll never give up, amended Hugh, and his smile was proud but a little wry. There's not a lady here tonight who has surrendered, no matter what her menfolks did at Appomattox. It's a lot worse on them than it ever was on us. At least... We took it out in fighting, and they in hating, finished Tommy. Eh, hey, Scarlet? It bothers the ladies to see what their men folks have come down to, lots more than it bothers us. Hugh was to be a judge. René was to play the fiddle before the crowned heads of Europe. He ducked as René aimed a blow at him. And I was to be a doctor. And now... Give us the time, cried René. Then I become the pie prince of this house. And my good Hugh, the king of the kindling, and you, my Tommy, you will own the Irish slaves instead of the darky slaves. What change! What fun! And what it do for you, Miss Scarlet and Miss Melly? You milk the cow, pig the cotton? Indeed, no said Scarlet coolly, unable to understand René's gay acceptance of hardships. Our darkies do that. Miss Melly, I hear she called her boy Beauregard. You tell her I, René, approve and say that except for Jesus, there is no better name. And though he smiled, his eyes glowed proudly at the name of Louisiana's dashing hero. Well, there's Robert Edward Lee, observed Tommy. 
And while I'm not trying to lessen old Bo's reputation, my first son is going to be named Bob Lee Welburn. Renee laughed and shrugged. I recount to you a joke, but it is a true story. And you see how Creole zinc of our brave Beauregard and of your General Lee. On the train near New Orleans, a man of Virginia, a man of General Lee, he meet with the Creole of the troops of Beauregard. And the man of Virginia, he talk, 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 how General Lee do this, General Lee say that. And the Creole, he look polite, and he wrinkle his forehead like he try to remember, and then he smile and say, General Lee, ah, we, oui, now I know, General Lee, the man General Beauregard speak well of. Scarlet tried to join politely in the laughter, but she didn't see any point to the story, except that Creoles were just as stuck up as Charleston and Savannah people. Moreover, she had always thought Ashley's son should have been named after him. The musicians, after preliminary tunings and whangings, broke into old Dan Tucker. And Tommy turned to her. Will you dance, Scarlet? I can't favor you, but Hugh or Renee... No, thank you. I'm still mourning my mother, said Scarlet hastily. I'll sit them out. Her eyes singled out Frank Kennedy and beckoned him from the side of Mrs. Elsing. I'll sit in that alcove yonder, if you'll bring me some refreshments, and then we can have a nice chat, she told Frank, as the other three men moved off. When he had hurried away to bring her a glass of wine and a paper-thin slice of cake, Scarlet sat down in the alcove at the end of the drawing room and carefully arranged her skirts so that the worst spots wouldn't show. The humiliating events of that morning with Rhett were pushed from her mind by the excitement of seeing so many people and hearing music again. Tomorrow she would think of Rhett's conduct and her shame, and they would make her writhe again. Tomorrow she would wonder if she had made any impression on Frank's hurt and bewildered heart. But not tonight. Tonight she was alive to her fingertips, every sense alert with hope, her eyes sparkling. She looked from the alcove into the huge drawing room and watched the dancers, remembering how beautiful this room had been when first she came to Atlanta during the war. Then the hardwood floors had shone like glass, and overhead the chandelier with its hundreds of tiny prisms had caught and reflected every ray of the dozens of candles it bore, flinging them like gleams from diamonds, flame and sapphire about the room. The old portraits on the walls had been dignified and gracious and had looked down upon guests with an air of mellowed hospitality. The rosewood sofas had been soft and inviting, and one of them, the largest, had stood in the place of honor in this same alcove where she now sat. It had been Scarlet's favorite seat at parties. From this point stretched the pleasant vista of drawing room and dining room beyond, the oval mahogany table which seated twenty, and the twenty slim-legged chairs demurely against the walls. The massive sideboard and buffet weighted with heavy silver, with seven branched candlesticks, goblets, cruets, decanters, and shining little glasses. Scarlet had sat on that sofa so often in the first years of the war, always with some handsome officer beside her, and listened to violin and bull fiddle, accordion and banjo, and heard the exciting swishing noises which dancing feet made on the waxed and polished floor. Now the chandelier hung dark. It was twisted askew, and most of the prisms were broken, as if the Yankee occupants had made their beauty a target for their boots. Now an oil lamp and a few candles lighted the room, and the roaring fire in the wide hearth gave most of the illumination. Its flickering light showed how irreparably scarred and splintered the dull old floor was. 
Squares on the faded paper on the wall gave evidence that once the portraits had hung there, and wide cracks in the plaster recalled the day during the siege when a shell had exploded on the house and torn off parts of the roof and second floor. The heavy old mahogany table, spread with cake and decanters, still presided in the empty-looking dining room, but it was scratched, and the broken legs showed signs of clumsy repair. The sideboard, the silver and the spindly chairs were gone. The dull gold damask draperies which had covered the arching French windows at the back of the room were missing, and only the remnants of the lace curtains remained, clean, but obviously mended. In place of the curved sofa she had liked so much was a hard bench that was none too comfortable. She sat upon it with as good grace as possible, wishing her skirts were in such condition that she could dance. It would be so good to dance again. But, of course, she could do more with Frank in this sequestered alcove than in a breathless reel, and she could listen fascinated to his talk and encourage him to greater flights of foolishness. But the music certainly was inviting. Her slipper patted longingly in time with old Levi's large splayed foot as he twanged a strident banjo and called the figures of the reel. Feet swished and scraped and patted as the twin lines danced toward each other, retreated, whirled, and made arches of their arms. Old Dan Tucker, he got drunk. Swing your partners. Fell into fire and he kicked up a chunk. Skip light, ladies. After the dull and exhausting months at Terra, it was good to hear music again, and the sound of dancing feet... Good to see familiar friendly faces laughing in the feeble light, calling old jokes and catchwords, bantering, rallying, coquetting. It was like coming to life again after being dead. It almost seemed that the bright days of five years ago had come back again. If she could close her eyes and not see the worn made-over dresses and the patched boots and mended slippers, if her mind didn't call up the faces of boys missing from the reel, she might almost think that nothing had changed. But as she looked, watching the old men grouped about the decanter in the dining room, the matrons lining the walls, talking behind fanless hands, and the swaying, skipping young dancers, it came to her suddenly, coldly, frighteningly, that it was all as greatly changed as if these familiar figures were ghosts. They looked the same, but they were different. What was it? Was it only that they were five years older? No, it was something more than the passing of time. Something had gone out of them, out of their world. Five years ago, a feeling of security had wrapped them all around so gently they were not even aware of it. In its shelter they had flowered. Now it was gone, and with it had gone the old thrill, the old sense of something delightful and exciting just around the corner, the old glamour of their way of living. She knew she had changed, too, but not as they had changed— and it puzzled her. She sat and watched them, and she felt herself an alien among them, as alien and lonely as if she had come from another world, speaking a language they did not understand, and she not understanding theirs. Then she knew that this feeling was the same one she felt with Ashley, with him and with people of his kind, and they made up most of her world. She felt outside of something she couldn't understand. Their faces were little changed, and their manners not at all, but it seemed to her that these two things were all that remained of her old friends. An ageless dignity, a timeless gallantry still clung about them, and would cling until they died but they would carry undying bitterness to their graves, a bitterness too deep for words. They were a soft-spoken, fierce, 
tired people who were defeated and would not know defeat, broken yet standing determinedly erect. They were crushed and helpless, citizens of conquered provinces. They were looking on the state they loved, seeing it trampled by the enemy, rascals making a mock of the law, their former slaves a menace, their men disfranchised, their women insulted. And they were remembering graves. Everything in their old world had changed but the old forms. The old usages went on, must go on, for the forms were all that were left to them. They were holding tightly to the things they knew best and loved best in the old days, the leisured manners, the courtesy, the pleasant casualness in human contacts, and most of all, the protecting attitude of the men toward their women. True to the tradition in which they had been reared, the men were courteous and tender, and they almost succeeded in creating an atmosphere of sheltering their women from all that was harsh and unfit for feminine eyes. That, thought Scarlet, was the height of absurdity. For there was little now which even the most cloistered women had not seen and known in the last five years. They had nursed the wounded, closed dying eyes, suffered war and fire and devastation, known terror and flight and starvation. But no matter what sights they had seen, what menial tasks they had done, and would have to do, they remained ladies and gentlemen, royalty in exile, bitter, aloof, incurious, kind to one another, diamond hard, as bright and brittle as the crystals of the broken chandelier over their heads. The old days had gone, but these people would go their ways as if the old days still existed, charming, leisurely, determined not to rush and scramble for pennies as the Yankees did, determined to part with none of the old ways. Scarlet knew that she too was greatly changed, otherwise... She could not have done the things she had done since she was last in Atlanta. Otherwise, she would not now be contemplating doing what she desperately hoped to do. But there was a difference in their hardness and hers, and just what the difference was, she could not, for the moment, tell. Perhaps it was that there was nothing she wouldn't do, and there were so many things these people would rather die than do. Perhaps it was that they were without hope, but still smiling at life, bowing gracefully and passing it by. And this Scarlet could not do. She could not ignore life. She had to live it. And it was too brutal, too hostile for her even to try to gloss over its harshness with a smile. Of the sweetness and courage and unyielding pride of her friends, Scarlet saw nothing. She saw only a silly stiff-neckedness, which observed facts, but smiled and refused to look them in the face. As she stared at the dancers, flushed from the reel, she wondered if things drove them as she was driven. Dead lovers, maimed husbands, children who were hungry, acres slipping away, beloved roofs that sheltered strangers... But of course they were driven. She knew their circumstances only a little less thoroughly than she knew her own. Their losses had been her losses. Their privations her privations. Their problems her same problems. Yet they had reacted differently to them. The faces she was seeing in the room were not faces. They were masks. Excellent masks which would never drop. But if they were suffering as acutely from brutal circumstances as she was, and they were, how could they maintain this air of gaiety and lightness of heart? Why, indeed, should they even try to do it? They were beyond her comprehension and vaguely irritating. She couldn't be like them. 
She couldn't survey the wreck of the world with an air of casual unconcern. She was as hunted as a fox, running with a bursting heart, trying to reach a burrow before the hounds caught up. Suddenly she hated them all because they were different from her, because they carried their losses with an air that she could never attain, would never wish to attain. She hated them, these smiling, light-footed strangers, these proud fools who took pride in something they had lost, seeming to be proud that they had lost it. The women bore themselves like ladies, and she knew they were ladies, though menial tasks were their daily lot, and they didn't know where their next dress was coming from. Ladies, all. But she couldn't feel herself a lady, for all her velvet dress and scented hair, for all the pride of birth that stood behind her, and the pride of wealth that had once been hers. Harsh contact with the red earth of Terra had stripped gentility from her, and she knew she would never feel like a lady again until her table was weighted with silver and crystal and smoking with rich food, until her own horses and carriages stood in her stables, until black hands and not white took the cotton from Terra. Ah, she thought angrily, sucking in her breath. That's the difference. Even though they're poor, they still feel like ladies, and I don't. The silly fools don't seem to realize that you can't be a lady without money. Even in this flash of revelation, she realized vaguely that, foolish though they seemed, theirs was the right attitude. Ellen would have thought so. This disturbed her. She knew she should feel as these people felt, but she could not. She knew she should believe devoutly, as they did, that a born lady remained a lady, even if reduced to poverty. But she could not make herself believe it now. All her life she had heard sneers hurled at the Yankees because their pretensions to gentility were based on wealth, not breeding. But at this moment, heresy though it was, she couldn't help thinking the Yankees were right on this one matter, even if wrong in all others. It took money to be a lady. She knew Ellen would have fainted had she ever heard such words from her daughter. No depth of poverty could ever have made Ellen feel ashamed. Ashamed? Yes, that was how Scarlet felt. Ashamed that she was poor and reduced to galling shifts and penury and work that Negroes should do. She shrugged in irritation. Perhaps these people were right and she was wrong, but just the same. These proud fools weren't looking forward as she was doing, straining every nerve, risking even honor and a good name to get back what they had lost. It was beneath the dignity of many of them to indulge in a scramble for money. The times were rude and hard. They called for rude and hard struggle, if one was to conquer them. Scarlet knew that family tradition would forcibly restrain many of these people from such a struggle, with the making of money admittedly its aim. They all thought that obvious money-making and even talk of money were vulgar in the extreme. Of course, there were exceptions. Mrs. Merriweather and her baking, and Renee driving the pie wagon and Hugh Elsing cutting and peddling firewood and Tommy contracting, and Frank having the gumption to start a store. But what of the rank and file of them? The planters would scratch a few acres and live in poverty. The lawyers and doctors would go back to their professions and wait for clients who might never come. And the rest, those who had lived in leisure on their incomes, what would happen to them? But she wasn't going to be poor all her life. She wasn't going to sit down and patiently wait for a miracle to help her. She was going to rush into life and wrest from it what she could. Her father had started as a poor immigrant boy and had won the broad acres of Terra. What he had done, his daughter could do. She wasn't like these people who had gambled everything on a cause that was gone and were content to be proud of having lost that cause, because it was worth any sacrifice. They drew their courage from the past, 
She was drawing hers from the future. Frank Kennedy, at present, was her future. At least, he had the store and he had cash money. And if she could only marry him and get her hands on that money, she could make ends meet at Terra for another year. And after that, Frank must buy the sawmill. She could see for herself how quickly the town was rebuilding, and anyone who could establish a lumber business now, when there was so little competition, would have a gold mine. There came to her, from the recesses of her mind, words Rhett had spoken in the early years of the war about the money he made in the blockade. She had not taken the trouble to understand them then, but now they seemed perfectly clear. And she wondered if it had been only her youth or plain stupidity which had kept her from appreciating them. There's just as much money to be made in the wreck of a civilization as in the upbuilding of one. This is the wreck he foresaw, she thought. And he was right. There's still plenty of money to be made by anyone who isn't afraid of work. Or to grab. She saw Frank coming across the floor toward her, with a glass of blackberry wine in his hand and a morsel of cake on a saucer, and she pulled her face into a smile. It did not occur to her to question whether Tara was worth marrying Frank. She knew it was worth it, and she never gave the matter a second thought. She smiled up at him as she sipped the wine, knowing that her cheeks were more attractively pink than any of the dancers. She moved her skirts for him to sit by her and waved her handkerchief idly so that the faint sweet smell of the cologne could reach his nose. She was proud of the cologne, for no other woman in the room was wearing any, and Frank had noticed it. In a fit of daring, he had whispered to her that she was as pink and fragrant as a rose. If only he were not so shy... He reminded her of a timid old brown field rabbit. If only he had the gallantry and ardor of the Tarleton boys, or even the coarse impudence of Rhett Butler. But if he possessed those qualities, he'd probably have sense enough to feel the desperation that lurked just beneath her demurely fluttering eyelids. As it was, he didn't know enough about women even to suspect what she was up to. That was her good fortune. But it didn't increase her respect for him. Chapter 36 She married Frank Kennedy two weeks later, after a whirlwind courtship which she blushingly told him left her too breathless to oppose his ardor any longer. He didn't know that during those two weeks she had walked the floor at night, gritting her teeth at the slowness with which he took hints and encouragements, praying that no untimely letter from Sue Ellen would reach him and ruin her plans. She thanked God that her sister was the poorest of correspondents, delighting to receive letters and disliking to write them. But there was always a chance, always a chance, she thought in the long night hours as she padded back and forth across the cold floor of her bedroom, with Ellen's faded shawl clutched about her nightdress. Frank didn't know she had received a laconic letter from Will, relating that Jonas Wilkerson had paid another call at Tara, and finding her gone to Atlanta, had stormed about until Will and Ashley threw him bodily off the place. Will's letter hammered into her mind the fact she knew only too well. That time was getting shorter and shorter before the extra taxes must be paid. A fierce desperation drove her as she saw the days slipping by and she wished she might grasp the hourglass in her hands and keep the sands from running. But so well did she conceal her feelings, so well did she enact her role, Frank suspected nothing, saw no more than what lay on the surface the pretty and helpless young widow of Charles Hamilton who greeted him every night in Miss Pittypat's parlor and listened, breathless with admiration, as he told of future plans for his store and how much money he expected to make when he was able to buy the sawmill. 
Her sweet sympathy and her bright-eyed interest in every word he uttered were balm upon the wound left by Sue Ellen's supposed defection. His heart was sore and bewildered at Sue Ellen's conduct, and his vanity, the shy, touchy vanity of a middle-aged bachelor who knows himself to be unattractive to women, was deeply wounded. He couldn't write Sue Ellen upbraiding her for her faithlessness, he shrank from the very idea. But he could ease his heart by talking about her to Scarlet. Without saying a disloyal word about Sue Ellen, she could tell him she understood how badly her sister had treated him, and what good treatment he merited from a woman who really appreciated him. Little Mrs. Hamilton was such a pretty pink-cheeked person, alternating between melancholy sighs when she thought of her sad plight and laughter as gay and sweet as the tinkling of tiny silver bells when he made small jokes to cheer her. Her green gown, now neatly cleaned by Mary, showed off her slender figure with its tiny waist to perfection, and how bewitching was the faint fragrance which always clung about her handkerchief and her hair. It was a shame that such a fine little woman should be alone and helpless in a world so rough that she didn't even understand its harshness. No husband, nor brother, nor even a father now to protect her. Frank thought the world too rude a place for a lone woman. And in that idea, Scarlet silently and heartily concurred. He came to call every night for the atmosphere of Pity's house was pleasant and soothing. Mammy's smile at the front door was a smile reserved for quality folks. Pity served him coffee laced with brandy and fluttered about him, and Scarlet hung on his every utterance. Sometimes in the afternoons he took Scarlet riding with him in his buggy when he went out on business. These rides were merry affairs because she asked so many foolish questions, just like a woman he told himself approvingly. He couldn't help laughing at her ignorance about business matters, and she laughed too, saying, Well, of course, you can't expect a silly little woman like me to understand men's affairs. She made him feel, for the first time in his old maidish life, that he was a strong, upstanding man fashioned by God in a nobler mold than other men, fashioned to protect silly helpless women. When, at last, they stood together to be married, her confiding little hand in his, and her downcast lashes throwing thick black crescents on her pink cheeks, he still did not know how it all came about. He only knew he had done something romantic and exciting for the first time in his life. He, Frank Kennedy, had swept this lovely creature off her feet and into his strong arms. That was a heady feeling. No friend or relative stood up with him at their marriage. The witnesses were strangers called in from the street. Scarlet had insisted on that, and he had given in, though reluctantly, for he would have liked his sister and his brother-in-law from Jonesboro to be with him and a reception with toast drunk to the bride in Miss Pity's parlor amid happy friends would have been a joy to him. But Scarlet would not hear of even Miss Pity being present. Just us two, Frank, she begged, squeezing his arm. Like an elopement. I always did want to run away and be married. Please, sweetheart, just for me. It was that endearing term still so new to his ears, and the bright teardrops which edged her pale green eyes as she looked up pleadingly at him, that won him over. After all, a man had to make some concessions to his bride, especially about the wedding, for women set such a store by sentimental things. And before he knew it, Frank gave her the three hundred dollars, bewildered by her sweet urgency, reluctant at first, because it meant the end of his hope of buying the sawmill immediately. But he couldn't see her family evicted, and his disappointment soon faded at the sight of her radiant happiness, disappeared entirely at the loving way she took on over his generosity. 
Frank had never before had a woman take on over him, and he came to feel that the money had been well spent after all. Scarlet dispatched Mammy to Tara immediately for the triple purpose of giving Will the money, announcing her marriage, and bringing Wade to Atlanta. In two days, she had a brief note from Will, which she carried about with her, and read and reread with mounting joy. Will wrote that the taxes had been paid, and Jonas Wilkerson acted up pretty bad at the news, but had made no other threat so far. Will closed by wishing her happiness, a laconic formal statement which he qualified in no way. She knew Will understood what she had done and why she had done it, and neither blamed nor praised. But what must Ashley think? She wondered feverishly. What must he think of me now, after what I said to him so short a while ago in the orchard at Tara? She also had a letter from Sue Ellen, poorly spelled, violent, abusive, tear-splotched, a letter so full of venom and truthful observations upon her character that she was never to forget it, nor forgive the writer. But even Sue Ellen's words could not dim her happiness that Tara was safe, at least from immediate danger. It was hard to realize that Atlanta and not Terra was her permanent home now. In her desperation to obtain the tax money, no thought save Terra and the fate which threatened it had any place in her mind. Even at the moment of marriage, she had not given a thought to the fact that the price she was paying for the safety of home was permanent exile from it. Now that the deed was done, she realized this with a wave of homesickness hard to dispel. But there it was. She had made her bargain, and she intended to stand by it. And she was so grateful to Frank for saving Tara, she felt a warm affection for him, and an equally warm determination that he should never regret marrying her. The ladies of Atlanta knew their neighbor's business only slightly less completely than they knew their own, and were far more interested in it. They all knew that for years Frank Kennedy had had an understanding with Sue Ellen O'Hara. In fact, he had said sheepishly that he expected to get married in the spring. So the tumult of gossip, surmise, and deep suspicion which followed the announcement of his quiet wedding to Scarlet was not surprising. Mrs. Merriweather, who never let her curiosity go long unsatisfied if she could help it, asked him point-blank just what he meant by marrying one sister when he was betrothed to the other. She reported to Mrs. Elsing that all the answer she got for her pains was a silly look. Not even Mrs. Merriweather, doughty soul that she was, dared to approach Scarlet on the subject. Scarlet seemed demure and sweet enough these days, but there was a pleased complacency in her eyes which annoyed people, and she carried a chip on her shoulder which no one cared to disturb. She knew Atlanta was talking, but she didn't care. After all, there wasn't anything immoral in marrying a man. Tara was safe. Let people talk. She had too many other matters to occupy her mind. The most important was how to make Frank realize in a tactful manner that his store should bring in more money. After the fright Jonas Wilkerson had given her, she would never rest easy until she and Frank had some money ahead. And even if no emergency developed, Frank would need to make more money if she was going to save enough for next year's taxes. Moreover, what Frank had said about the sawmill stuck in her mind. Frank could make lots of money out of a mill, Anybody could, with lumber selling at such outrageous prices. She fretted silently because Frank's money had not been enough to pay the taxes on Terra and buy the mill as well. And she made up her mind that he had to make more money on the store somehow and do it quickly so he could buy that mill before someone else snapped it up. She could see it was a bargain. If she were a man, she would have that mill if she had to mortgage the store to raise the money. 
But when she intimated this delicately to Frank, the day after they married, he smiled and told her not to bother her sweet, pretty little head about business matters. It had come as a surprise to him that she even knew what a mortgage was, and at first he was amused. But this amusement quickly passed, and a sense of shock took its place in the early days of their marriage. Once, incautiously, he had told her that people, he was careful not to mention names, owed him money, but couldn't pay just now, and he was, of course, unwilling to press old friends and gentle folk. Frank regretted ever mentioning it, for thereafter she had questioned him about it again and again. She had the most charmingly childlike air, but she was just curious, she said, to know who owed him and how much they owed. Frank was very evasive about the matter. He coughed nervously and waved his hands and repeated his annoying remark about her sweet, pretty little head. It had begun to dawn on him that this same sweet, pretty little head was a good head for figures. In fact, a much better one than his own, and the knowledge was disquieting. He was thunderstruck to discover that she could swiftly add a long column of figures in her head when he needed a pencil and paper for more than three figures. And fractions presented no difficulties to her at all. He felt there was something unbecoming about a woman understanding fractions and business matters, and he believed that should a woman be so unfortunate as to have such unladylike comprehension, she should pretend not to. Now he disliked talking business with her as much as he had enjoyed it before they were married. Then he had thought it all beyond her mental grasp, and it had been pleasant to explain things to her. Now he saw that she understood entirely too well, and he felt the usual masculine indignation at the duplicity of women. Added to it was the usual masculine disillusionment in discovering that a woman has a brain. Just how early in his married life Frank learned of the deception Scarlet had used in marrying him, no one ever knew. Perhaps the truth dawned on him when Tony Fontaine, obviously fancy-free, came to Atlanta on business. Perhaps it was told him more directly in letters from his sister in Jonesboro, who was astounded at his marriage. Certainly he never learned from Sue Ellen herself. She never wrote him, and naturally he couldn't write her and explain. What good would explanations do anyway? now that he was married. He writhed inwardly at the thought that Sue Ellen would never know the truth and would always think he had senselessly jilted her. Perhaps everyone else was thinking this too and criticizing him. It certainly put him in an awkward position, and he had no way of clearing himself, for a man couldn't go about saying he had lost his head about a woman and a gentleman couldn't advertise the fact that his wife had entrapped him with a lie. Scarlet was his wife, and a wife was entitled to the loyalty of her husband. Furthermore, he couldn't bring himself to believe she had married him coldly, and with no affection for him at all. His masculine vanity wouldn't permit such a thought to stay long in his mind. It was more pleasant to think she had fallen so suddenly in love with him, she had been willing to lie to get him. But it was all very puzzling. He knew he was no great catch for a woman half his age, and pretty and smart to boot. But Frank was a gentleman, and he kept his bewilderment to himself. Scarlet was his wife, and he couldn't insult her by asking awkward questions, which, after all, wouldn't remedy matters. Not that Frank especially wanted to remedy matters, for it appeared that his marriage would be a happy one. Scarlet was the most charming and exciting of women, and he thought her perfect in all things, except that she was so headstrong. Frank learned early in his marriage that so long as she had her own way, life could be very pleasant. But when she was opposed... Given her own way, she was as gay as a child, 
laughed a good deal, made foolish little jokes, sat on his knee and tweaked his beard until he vowed he felt twenty years younger. She could be unexpectedly sweet and thoughtful, having his slippers toasting at the fire when he came home at night, fussing affectionately about his wet feet and interminable head colds, remembering that he always liked the gizzard of the chicken and three spoonfuls of sugar in his coffee. Yes, life was very sweet and cozy with Scarlet, as long as she had her own way. When the marriage was two weeks old, Frank contracted the grip and Dr. Mead put him to bed. In the first year of the war, Frank had spent two months in the hospital with pneumonia, and he had lived in dread of another attack since that time, so he was only too glad to lie sweating under three blankets and drink the hot concoctions Mammy and Aunt Pity brought him every hour. The illness dragged on, and Frank worried more and more about the store as each day passed. The place was in charge of the counter boy, who came to the house every night to report on the day's transactions, but Frank wasn't satisfied. He fretted until Scarlet, who had only been waiting for such an opportunity, laid a cool hand on his forehead and said, Now, sweetheart, I shall be vexed if you take on so. I'll go to town and see how things are. And she went, smiling as she smothered his feeble protests. During the three weeks of her new marriage, she had been in a fever to see his account books and find out just how money matters stood. What luck that he was bedridden. The store stood near Five Points, its new roof glaring against the smoked bricks of the old walls. Wooden awnings covered the sidewalk to the edge of the street. And at the long iron bars connecting the uprights, Horses and mules were hitched. Their heads bowed against the cold, misty rain, their backs covered with torn blankets and quilts. The inside of the store was almost like Bullard's store in Jonesboro, except that there were no loungers about the roaring red-hot stove, whittling and spitting streams of tobacco juice at the sandboxes. It was bigger than Bullard's store and much darker, the wooden awnings cut off most of the winter daylight, and the interior was dim and dingy, only a trickle of light coming in through the small fly-specked windows high up on the side walls. The floor was covered with muddy sawdust, and everywhere was dust and dirt. There was a semblance of order in the front of the store, where tall shelves rose into the gloom stacked with bright bolts of cloth, china, cooking utensils and notions. But in the back, behind the partition, chaos reigned. Here there was no flooring, and the assorted jumble of stock was piled helter-skelter on the hard-packed earth. In the semi-darkness she saw boxes and bales of goods, plows and harness and saddles and cheap pine coffins. Second-hand furniture, ranging from cheap gum to mahogany and rosewood, reared up in the gloom and the rich but worn brocade and horsehair upholstery gleamed incongruously in the dingy surroundings. China chambers and bowl and pitcher sets littered the floor, and all around the four walls were deep bins, so dark she had to hold the lamp directly over them to discover they contained seeds, nails, bolts, and carpenter's tools. I'd think a man as fussy and old maidish as Frank would keep things tidier, she thought scrubbing her griming hands with her handkerchief. This place is a pig pen. What a way to run a store. If he'd only dust up this stuff and put it out in front where folks could see it, he could sell things much quicker. And if his stock was in such condition, what mustn't his account be? I look at his account book now, she thought, and picking up the lamp, she went into the front of the store. Willie, the counterboy, was reluctant to give her the large, dirty-backed ledger. It was obvious that, young as he was, he shared Frank's opinion that women had no place in business. 
but Scarlet silenced him with a sharp word and sent him out to get his dinner. She felt better when he was gone, for his disapproval annoyed her, and she settled herself in a split-bottomed chair by the roaring stove, tucked one foot under her, and spread the book across her lap. It was dinner time, and the streets were deserted. No customers called, and she had the store to herself. She turned the pages slowly, narrowly scanning the rows of names and figures written in Frank's cramped, copper-plate hand. It was just as she had expected, and she frowned as she saw this newest evidence of Frank's lack of business sense. At least five hundred dollars in debts, some of them months old, were set down against the names of people she knew well, the Merryweathers and the Elsings, among other familiar names. From Frank's deprecatory remarks about the money people owed him, she had imagined the sums to be small. But this... If they can't pay, why do they keep on buying? She thought irritably. And if he knows they can't pay, why does he keep on selling them stuff? Lots of them could pay if he'd just make them do it. The Elsings certainly could, if they could give Fanny a new satin dress and an expensive wedding. Frank's just too soft-hearted, and people take advantage of him. Why, if he'd collected half this money, he could have bought the sawmill and easily spared me the tax money, too. Then, she thought, just imagine Frank trying to operate a sawmill, God's nightgown. If he runs this store like a charitable institution, how could he expect to make money on a mill? The sheriff would have it in a month. Why, I could run this store better than he does, and I could run a mill better than he could, even if I don't know anything about the lumber business. A startling thought, this, that a woman could handle business matters as well as or better than a man. A revolutionary thought to Scarlet, who had been reared in the tradition that men were omniscient and women none too bright. Of course, she had discovered that this was not altogether true, but the pleasant fiction still stuck in her mind. Never before had she put this remarkable idea into words. She sat quite still, with a heavy book across her lap, her mouth a little open with surprise, thinking that during the lean months at Terra she had done a man's work, and done it well. She had been brought up to believe that a woman alone could accomplish nothing. Yet she had managed the plantation without men to help her until Will came. Why, why, her mind stuttered. I believe women could manage everything in the world without men's help, except having babies. And God knows, no woman in her right mind would have babies if she could help it. With the idea that she was as capable as a man came a sudden rush of pride and a violent longing to prove it, to make money for herself as men made money, money which would be her own, which she would neither have to ask for nor account for to any man. I wish I had enough money to buy that mill myself, she said aloud and sighed. I'd sure make it hum. And I wouldn't let even one splitter go out on credit. She sighed again. There was nowhere she could get any money. So the idea was out of the question. Frank would simply have to collect this money owing him and buy the mill. It was a sure way to make money. And when he got the mill, she would certainly find some way to make him be more businesslike in its operation than he had been with the store. She pulled a back page out of the ledger and began copying the list of debtors who had made no payments in several months. She'd take the matter up with Frank just as soon as she reached home. She'd make him realize that these people had to pay their bills even if they were old friends even if it did embarrass him to press them for money. That would probably upset Frank, for he was timid and fond of the approbation of his friends. He was so thin-skinned he'd rather lose the money than be businesslike about collecting it. 
and he'd probably tell her that no one had any money with which to pay him. Well, perhaps that was true. Poverty was certainly no news to her. But nearly everybody had saved some silver or jewelry or was hanging on to a little real estate. Frank could take them in lieu of cash. She could imagine how Frank would moan when she broached such an idea to him. Take the jewelry and property of his friends? Well, she shrugged, he can moan all he likes. I'm going to tell him that he may be willing to stay poor for friendship's sake, but I'm not. Frank will never get anywhere if he doesn't get up some gumption. And he's got to get somewhere. He's got to make money, even if I've got to wear the pants in the family to make him do it. She was writing busily, her face screwed up with the effort, her tongue clamped between her teeth, when the front door opened and a great draft of cold wind swept the store. A tall man came into the dingy room, walking with a light Indian-like tread. And looking up, she saw Rhett Butler. He was resplendent in new clothes and a great coat with a dashing cape thrown back from his heavy shoulders. His tall hat was off in a deep bow when her eyes met his and his hand went to the bosom of a spotless pleated shirt. His white teeth gleamed startlingly against his brown face and his bold eyes raked her. My dear Mrs. Kennedy, he said, walking toward her, my very dear Mrs. Kennedy. And he broke into a loud, merry laugh. At first she was as startled as if a ghost had invaded the store, and then hastily removing her foot from beneath her, she stiffened her spine and gave him a cold stare. What are you doing here? I called on Miss Pittypad and learned of your marriage, and so I hastened here to congratulate you. The memory of her humiliation at his hands made her go crimson with shame. "'I don't see how you have the gall to face me,' she cried. "'On the contrary. "'How have you the gall to face me? "'Oh, you are the most... "'Shall we let the bugle sing truce?' He smiled down at her, a wide, flashing smile that had impudence in it, but no shame for his own actions or condemnation for hers. In spite of herself, she had to smile too, but it was a wry, uncomfortable smile. What a pity they didn't hang you. Others share your feeling, I fear. Come, Scarlet, relax. You look like you'd swallowed a ramrod and it isn't becoming. Surely you've had time to recover from my... Uh, my little joke. Joke? Ha! I'll never get over it. Oh, yes, you will. You're just putting on this indignant front because you think it's proper and respectable. May I sit down? No. He sank into a chair beside her and grinned. I hear you couldn't even wait two weeks for me, he said, and gave a mock sigh. How fickle is woman! When she didn't reply, he continued. Tell me, Scarlet, just between friends, between very old and very intimate friends, wouldn't it have been wiser to wait until I got out of jail? Or are the charms of wedlock with old Frank Kennedy more alluring than illicit relations with me? As always, when his mockery aroused wrath within her, wrath fought with laughter at his impudence, don't be absurd. Then would you mind satisfying my curiosity on one point which has bothered me for some time? Did you have no womanly repugnance, no delicate shrinking from marrying not just one man but two for whom you had no love or even affection? Or have I been misinformed about the delicacy of our southern womanhood? Rhett! I have my answer. I always felt that women had a hardness and endurance unknown to men, despite the pretty idea taught me in childhood that women are frail, tender, sensitive creatures. 
But after all, according to the Continental Code of Etiquette, it's very bad form for husband and wife to love each other. Very bad taste, indeed. I always felt that the Europeans had the right idea in that matter. Marry for convenience and love for pleasure. A sensible system, don't you think? You are closer to the old country than I thought. How pleasant it would be to shout at him, I did not marry for convenience. But unfortunately, Rhett had her there, and any protest of injured innocence would only bring more barbed remarks from him. Oh, how you do run on, she said coolly. Anxious to change the subject, she asked, How did you ever get out of jail? Oh, that, he answered, making an airy gesture. Not much trouble. They let me out this morning. I employed a delicate system of blackmail on a friend in Washington who is quite high in the councils of the federal government. A splendid fellow, one of the staunch Union patriots from whom I used to buy muskets and hoop skirts for the Confederacy. When my distressing predicament was brought to his attention in the right way, he hastened to use his influence, and so I was released. Influence is everything, Scarlet. Remember that when you get arrested. Influence is everything, and guilt or innocence merely an academic question. I'll take oath you weren't innocent. No, now that I'm free of the toils, I'll frankly admit that I'm as guilty as Cain. I did kill the nigger. He was uppity to a lady, and what else could a southern gentleman do? And while I'm confessing, I must admit that I shot a Yankee cavalryman after some words in a bar room. I was not charged with that peccadillo, so perhaps some other poor devil has been hanged for it long since. He was so blithe about his murders, her blood chilled. Words of moral indignation rose to her lips, but suddenly she remembered the Yankee who lay under the tangle of scuppernong vines at Terra. He had not been on her conscience any more than a roach upon which she might have stepped. She could not sit in judgment on Rhett when she was as guilty as he. And as I seem to be making a clean breast of it, I must tell you in strictest confidence, that means don't tell Miss Pittypat, that I did have the money, safe in a bank in Liverpool. The money? Yes, the money the Yankees were so curious about. Scarlet, it wasn't altogether meanness that kept me from giving you the money you wanted. If I'd drawn a draft, they could have traced it somehow, and I doubt if you'd have gotten a cent. My only hope lay in doing nothing. I knew the money was pretty safe, for if worst came to worst, if they had located it and tried to take it away from me, I would have named every Yankee patriot who sold me bullets and machinery during the war. Then there would have been a stink, for some of them are high up in Washington now. In fact, it was my threat to unbosom my conscience about them that got me out of jail. I... Do you mean you... you actually have the Confederate gold? Not all of it, good heavens, no! There must be fifty or more ex-blockaders who have plenty salted away in Nassau and England and Canada. We'll be pretty unpopular with the Confederates who weren't as slick as we were. I have got close to half a million. Just think, Scarlet, a half million dollars. If you'd only restrained your fiery nature and not rushed into wedlock again. A half million dollars. She felt a pang of almost physical sickness at the thought of so much money. His jeering words passed over her head, and she didn't even hear them. It was hard to believe there was so much money in all this bitter and poverty-stricken world. So much money, so very much money, and someone else had it. Someone who took it lightly and didn't need it. And she had only a sick elderly husband and this dirty piddling little store between her and a hostile world. 
It wasn't fair that a reprobate like Rhett Butler should have so much, and she who carried so heavy a load should have so little. She hated him, sitting there in his dandified attire, taunting her. Well, she wouldn't swell his conceit by complimenting him on his cleverness. She longed viciously for sharp words with which to cut him. Suppose you think it's honest to keep the Confederate money. Well, it isn't. It's plain out-and-out -out stealing, and you know it. I wouldn't have that on my conscience. My, how sour the grapes are today, he exclaimed, screwing up his face. And just whom am I stealing from? She was silent, trying to think just whom indeed. After all, he had only done what Frank had done on a small scale. Half the money is honestly mine, he continued. Honestly made with the aid of honest Union patriots who were willing to sell out the Union behind its back for one hundred percent profit on their goods. Part I made out of my little investment in cotton at the beginning of the war. The cotton I bought cheap and sold for a dollar a pound when the British mills were crying for it. Part I got from food speculation. Why should I let the Yankees have the fruits of my labor? But the rest did belong to the Confederacy. It came from Confederate cotton, which I managed to run through the blockade and sell in Liverpool at sky-high prices. The cotton was given me in good faith to buy leather and rifles and machinery with, and it was taken by me in good faith to buy the same. My orders were to leave the gold in English banks under my own name in order that my credit would be good. You remember when the blockade tightened, I couldn't get a boat out of any Confederate port or into one? So there the money stayed in England? What should I have done? Drawn out all that gold from English banks like a simpleton? And tried to run it into Wilmington and let the Yankees capture it? Was it my fault that the blockade got too tight? Was it my fault that our cause failed? The money belonged to the Confederacy. Well, there is no Confederacy now, though you'd never know it to hear some people talk. Whom shall I give the money to? The Yankee government? I should so hate for people to think me a thief. He removed a leather case from his pocket, extracted a long cigar and smelled it approvingly, meanwhile watching her with pseudo-anxiety as if he hung on her words. Plague take him, she thought. He's always one jump ahead of me. There is always something wrong with his arguments, but I can never put my finger on just what it is. You might, she said with dignity, distribute it to those who are in need. The Confederacy is gone, but there are plenty of Confederates and their families who are starving. He threw back his head and laughed rudely. You are never so charming or so absurd as when you are airing some hypocrisy like that, he cried in frank enjoyment. Always tell the truth, Scarlet. You can't lie. The Irish are the poorest liars in the world. Come now, be frank. You never gave a damn about the late lamented Confederacy, and you care less about the starving Confederates. You'd scream in protest if I even suggested giving away all that money unless I started off by giving you the lion's share. Oh, I don't want your money, she began, trying to be coldly dignified. Oh, don't you? Your palm is itching to beat the band this minute. If I showed you a quarter, you'd leap on it. If you have come here to insult me and laugh at my poverty, I will wish you a good day, she retorted trying to rid her lap of the heavy ledger so she might rise and make her words more impressive. Instantly, he was on his feet, bending over her, laughing as he pushed her back into the chair. When will you ever get over losing your temper when you hear the truth? You never mind speaking the truth about other people, so why should you mind hearing it about yourself? I'm not insulting you. I think acquisitiveness is a very fine quality. She was not sure what acquisitiveness meant, but as he praised it, she felt slightly mollified. I didn't come to gloat over your poverty, but to wish you long life and happiness in your marriage. 
By the way, what did Sister Sue think of your larceny? My what? You're stealing Frank from under her nose. I did not. Well, we won't quibble about the word. What did she say? She said nothing, said Scarlet. His eyes danced as they gave her the lie. How unselfish of her. Now let's hear about your poverty. Surely I have the right to know, after your little trip out to the jail not long ago. Hasn't Frank as much money as you hoped? There was no evading his impudence. Either she would have to put up with it or ask him to leave. And now she didn't want him to leave. His words were barbed, but they were the barbs of truth. He knew what she had done and why she had done it. And he didn't seem to think the less of her for it. And though his questions were unpleasantly blunt, they seemed actuated by a friendly interest. He was one person to whom she could tell the truth. That would be a relief, for it had been so long since she had told anyone the truth about herself and her motives. Whenever she spoke her mind, everyone seemed to be shocked. Talking to Rhett was comparable only to one thing, the feeling of ease and comfort afforded by a pair of old slippers after dancing in a pair too tight. Didn't you get the money for the taxes? Don't tell me the wolf is still at the door of terror. There was a different tone in his voice. She looked up to meet his dark eyes and caught an expression which startled and puzzled her at first, and then made her suddenly smile. A sweet and charming smile which was seldom on her face these days. What a perverse wretch he was. But how nice he could be at times. She knew now that the real reason for his call was not to tease her, but to make sure she had gotten the money for which she had been so desperate. She knew now that he had hurried to her as soon as he was released, without the slightest appearance of hurry, to lend her the money if she still needed it. And yet he would torment and insult her and deny that such was his intent should she accuse him. He was quite beyond all comprehension. Did he really care about her more than he was willing to admit? Or did he have some other motive? Probably the latter, she thought. But who could tell? He did such strange things sometimes. No, she said. The wolf isn't at the door any longer. I, I got the money. But not without a struggle, I'll warrant. Did you manage to restrain yourself until you got the wedding ring on your finger? She tried not to smile at his accurate summing up of her conduct, but she couldn't help dimpling. He seated himself again, sprawling his long legs comfortably. Well, tell me about your poverty. Did Frank, the brute, mislead you about his prospects? He should be soundly thrashed for taking advantage of a helpless female. Come, Scarlet, tell me everything. You should have no secrets from me. Surely I know the worst about you. Oh, Rhett, you're the worst. Well, I don't know what. No, he didn't exactly fool me, but... Suddenly, it became a pleasure to unburden herself. Rhett, if Frank would just collect the money people owe him, I wouldn't be worried about anything. But, Rhett, fifty people owe him and he won't press them. He's so thin-skinned. He says a gentleman can't do that to another gentleman. And it may be months, and maybe never before we get the money. Well, what of it? Haven't you enough to eat on till he does collect? Yes, but... Well, as a matter of fact, I could use a little money right now. Her eyes brightened as she thought of the mill. Perhaps... What for? More taxes? Is that any of your business? Yes. Because you are getting ready to touch me for a loan. Oh, I know all the approaches, and I'll lend it to you without, my dear Mrs. Kennedy, that charming collateral you offered me a short while ago. Unless, of course, you insist. 
You are the coarsest. Not at all. I merely wanted to set your mind at ease. I knew you'd be worried about that point. Not much worried, but a little. And I'm willing to lend you the money, but I do want to know how you're going to spend it. I have that right, I believe. If it's to buy your pretty frocks or a carriage, take it with my blessing. But if it's to buy a new pair of breeches for Ashley Wilkes, I fear I must decline to lend it. She was hot with sudden rage, and she stuttered until words came. Ashley Wilkes has never taken a cent from me. I couldn't make him take a cent if he was starving. You don't understand him, how honorable, how proud he is. Of course, you can't understand him being what you are. Don't let's begin calling names. I could call you a few that would match any you could think of for me. You forget that I've been keeping up with you through Miss Pittypat, and the dear soul tells all she knows to any sympathetic listener. I know that Ashley's been a terror ever since he came home from Rock Island. I know that you have even put up with having his wife around, which must have been a strain on you. Ashley is... Oh, yes, he said, waving his hand negligently. Ashley is too sublime for my earthly comprehension. But please don't forget, I was an interested witness to your tender scene with him at Twelve Oaks, and something tells me he hasn't changed since then. And neither have you. He didn't cut so sublime a figure that day, if I remember rightly. And I don't think the figure he cuts now is much better. Why doesn't he take his family and get out and find work and stop living in terror? Of course, it's just a whim of mine, but I don't intend to lend you a cent for Tara to help support him. Among men, there's a very unpleasant name for men who permit women to support them. How dare you say such things? He's been working like a field hand. For all her rage, her heart was wrung by the memory of Ashley splitting fence rails. And worth his weight in gold, I dare say. What a hand he must be with the manure, and he's... Oh, yes, I know. Let's grant that he does the best he can, but I don't imagine he's much help. You'll never make a farm hand out of a Wilkes, or anything else that's useful. The breed is purely on a metal. Now quiet your ruffled feathers and overlook my boorish remarks about the proud and honorable Ashley... Strange how these illusions will persist, even in women as hard-headed as you are. How much money do you want, and what do you want it for? When she didn't answer, he repeated, What do you want it for? And see if you can manage to tell me the truth. It will do as well as a lie. In fact, better. For if you lie to me, I'll be sure to find it out. And think how embarrassing that would be. Always remember this, Scarlet. I can stand anything from you but a lie. Your dislike for me, your tempers, all your... Raging as she was at his attack on Ashley. She would have given anything to spit on him and throw his offer of money proudly into his mocking face. For a moment she almost did... But the cold hand of common sense held her back. She swallowed her anger with poor grace and tried to assume an expression of pleasant dignity. He leaned back in his chair, stretching his legs toward the stove. If there's one thing in the world that gives me more amusement than anything else, he remarked, it's the sight of your mental struggles when a matter of principle is laid up against something practical like money. Of course, I know the practical in you will always win. But I keep hanging around to see if your better nature won't triumph some day. And when that day comes, I shall pack my bag and leave Atlanta forever. There are too many women whose better natures are always triumphing. Well, let's get back to business. How much and what for? I don't know quite how much I'll need. She said sulkily. But I want to buy a sawmill. And I think I can get it cheap. And I'll need two wagons and two mules. I want good mules, too. And a horse and buggy for my own use. 
A sawmill? Yes. And if you lend me the money, I'll give you a half interest in it. Whatever would I do with a sawmill? Make money. We can make loads of money. Or I'll pay you interest on the loan. Let's see. What's good interest? Fifty percent is considered very fine. Fifty? Oh, but you are joking. Stop laughing, you devil. I'm serious. That's why I'm laughing. I wonder if anyone but me realizes what goes on in that head back of your deceptively sweet face. Well, who cares? Listen, Rhett, and see if this doesn't sound like good business to you. Frank told me about this man who has a sawmill, a little one out Peachtree Road, and he wants to sell it. He's got to have cash money pretty quick, and he'll sell it cheap. There aren't many sawmills around here now, and the way people are rebuilding, why, we could sell lumber sky high. The man will stay and run the mill for a wage. Frank told me about it. Frank would buy the mill himself if he had the money. I guess he was intending buying it with the money he gave me for the taxes. Poor Frank. What is he going to say when you tell him you've bought it yourself right out from under him? And how are you going to explain my lending you the money without compromising your reputation? Scarlet had given no thought to this. So intent was she upon the money the mill would bring in. Well, I just won't tell him. He'll know you didn't pick it off a bush. I'll tell him. Well, yes, I'll tell him I sold you my diamond ear bobs. And I'll give them to you, too. That'll be my collapse. My what you call it? I wouldn't take your ear bobs. I don't want them. I don't like them. They aren't really mine anyway. Whose are they? Her mind went swiftly back to the still hot noon with a country hush deep about Tara, and the dead man in blue sprawled in the hall. They were left with me by someone who's dead. They're mine, all right. Take them. I don't want them. I'd rather have the money for them. Good Lord, he cried impatiently. Don't you ever think of anything but money? No, she replied frankly, turning hard green eyes upon him. And if you'd been through what I have, you wouldn't either. I found out that money is the most important thing in the world, and as God is my witness, I don't ever intend to be without it again. She remembered the hot sun the soft red earth under her sick head, the niggery smell of the cabin behind the ruins of Twelve Oaks, remembered the refrain her heart had beaten, I'll never be hungry again. I'll never be hungry again. I'm going to have money someday, lots of it, so I can have anything I want to eat. And then there'll never be any harmony or dried peas on my table. And I'm going to have pretty clothes, and all of them are going to be silk. All? All, she said shortly, not even troubling to blush at his implication. I'm going to have money enough so the Yankees can never take Tara away from me. And I'm going to have a new roof for Tara, and a new barn and fine mules for plowing, and more cotton than you ever saw. And Wade isn't ever going to know what it means to do without the things he needs. Never. He's going to have everything in the world. And all my family, they aren't ever going to be hungry again. I mean it, every word. You don't understand. You're such a selfish hound. You've never had the carpetbaggers trying to drive you out. You've never been cold and ragged and had to break your back to keep from starving. He said quietly, I was in the Confederate Army for eight months. I don't know any better place for starving. The Army? Bah! You never had to pick cotton and weed corn. You... Don't you laugh at me! His hands were on hers again as her voice rose harshly. I wasn't laughing at you. I was laughing at the difference in what you look and what you really are. And I was remembering the first time I ever saw you at the barbecue at the Wilkes's. You had on a green dress and little green slippers and you were knee-deep in men and quite full of yourself. I'll wager you didn't know then how many pennies were in a dollar. 
There was only one idea in your whole mind then, and that was ensnaring Ash. She jerked her hand away from him. Rhett, if we are to get on at all, you'll have to stop talking about Ashley Wilkes. We'll always fall out about him because you can't understand him. I suppose you understand him like a book, said Rhett maliciously. No, Scarlet. If I'm to lend you the money, I reserve the right to discuss Ashley Wilkes in any terms I care to. I waive the right to collect interest on my loan, but not that right. And there are a number of things about that young man I'd like to know. I do not have to discuss him with you, she answered shortly. Oh, but you do. I hold the purse strings, you see. Some day, when you are rich, you can have the power to do the same to others. It's obvious that you still care about him. I do not. Oh, it's so obvious from the way you rush to his defense. You, I won't stand having my friend sneered at. Well, we'll let that pass for the moment. Does he still care for you, or did Rock Island make him forget? Or perhaps he's learned to appreciate what a jewel of a wife he has. At the mention of Melanie, Scarlet began to breathe hard, and could scarcely restrain herself from crying out the whole story that only honor kept Ashley with Melanie. She opened her mouth to speak, and then closed it. Oh, so he still hasn't enough sense to appreciate Mrs. Wilkes, and the rigors of prison didn't dim his ardor for you. I see no need to discuss the subject. I wish. To discuss it," said Rhett. There was a low note in his voice which Scarlet didn't understand, but didn't like to hear. And by God, I will discuss it, and I expect you to answer me. So he's still in love with you. Well, what if he is? cried Scarlet, goaded. I don't care to discuss him with you because you can't understand him or his kind of love. The only kind of love you know about is just. Well, the kind you carry on with creatures like that Watling woman. Oh," said Brett softly. "So I am only capable of carnal lusts. Well, you know it's true. Now I appreciate your hesitance in discussing the matter with me. My unclean hands and lips besmirch the purity of his love. Well, yes, something like that. I'm interested in this pure love. Don't be so nasty, Rhett Butler. If you are vile enough to think there's ever been anything wrong between us, oh, the thought never entered my head. Really, that's why it all interests me. Just why hasn't there been anything wrong between you? If you think that Ashley would, ah, so it's Ashley and not you. Who has fought the fight for purity? Really, Scarlet, you should not give yourself away so easily. Scarlet looked into his smooth, unreadable face in confusion and indignation. We won't go any further with this, and I don't want your money. So get out. Oh yes, you do want my money, and as we've gone this far, why stop? Surely there can be no harm in discussing so chaste and idle. When there hasn't been anything wrong, so Ashley loves you for your mind, your soul, your nobility of character. Scarlet writhed at his words. Of course, Ashley loved her for just these things. It was this knowledge that made life endurable, this knowledge that Ashley, bound by honor, loved her from afar for beautiful things deep buried in her that he alone could see. But they didn't seem so beautiful when dragged to the light by Rhett, especially in that deceptively smooth voice that covered sarcasm. It gives me back my boyish ideals to know that such a love can exist in this naughty world. He continued. So there's no touch of the flesh in his love for you. It would be the same if you were ugly and didn't have that white skin. And if you didn't have those green eyes, which make a man wonder just what you would do if he took you in his arms, 
and a way of swaying your hips. That's an allurement to any man under ninety. And those lips, which are, well, I mustn't let my carnal lusts obtrude. Ashley sees none of these things, or if he sees them, they move him not at all. Unbidden, Scarlet's mind went back to that day in the orchard, when Ashley's arm shook as he held her, when his mouth was hot on hers as if he would never let her go. She went crimson at the memory, and her blush was not lost on Rhett. So, he said, and there was a vibrant note almost like anger in his voice. I see. He loves you for your mind alone. How dare he pry with dirty fingers, making the one beautiful sacred thing in her life seem vile. Coolly, determinedly, he was breaking down the last of her reserves, and the information he wanted was forthcoming. Yes, he does, she cried. "'pushing back the memory of Ashley's lips. "'My dear, he doesn't even know you've got a mind. "'If it was your mind that attracted him, "'he wouldn't need to struggle against you, "'as he must have done to keep this love so, shall we say, holy. "'He could rest easily, for after all, "'a man can admire a woman's mind and soul "'and still be an honorable gentleman and true to his wife.' But it must be difficult for him to reconcile the honor of the Wilkeses with coveting your body as he does. You judge everybody's mind by your own vile one. No, oh, I've never denied coveting you, if that's what you mean. But thank God I'm not bothered about matters of honor. What I want, I take if I can get it, and so I wrestle neither with angels nor devils. What a merry hell you must have made for Ashley. Almost I can be sorry for him. I, I make a hell for him? Yes, you. There you are, a constant temptation to him. But like most of his breed, he prefers what passes in these parts as honor to any amount of love. And it looks to me as if the poor devil now had neither love nor honor to warm himself. He has love... I mean, he loves me. Does he? Then answer me this, and we are through for the day, and you can take the money and throw it in the gutter for all I care. Rhett rose to his feet and threw his half-smoked cigar in the spittoon. There was about his movements the same pagan freedom and leashed power Scarlet had noted that night at Lantafell. Something sinister and a little frightening. If he loved you, then why in hell did he permit you to come to Atlanta to get the tax money? Before I'd let a woman I'd love do that, I'd... He didn't know. He had no idea that I... Doesn't it occur to you that he should have known? There was barely suppressed savagery in his voice. Loving you as you say he does, he should have known just what you would do when you were desperate. He should have killed you rather than let you come up here. And to me, of all people, God in heaven. But he didn't know. If he didn't guess it without being told, he'll never know anything about you and your precious mind. How unfair he was. As if Ashley was a mind reader as if Ashley could have stopped her, even had he known. But she knew suddenly Ashley could have stopped her. The faintest intimation from him in the orchard that some day things might be different and she would never have thought of going to Rhett. A word of tenderness, even a parting caress when she was getting on the train, would have held her back. But he had only talked of honor. Yet... Was Rhett right? Should Ashley have known her mind? Swiftly she put the disloyal thought from her. Of course, he didn't suspect. Ashley would never suspect that she would even think of doing anything so immoral. Ashley was too fine to have such thoughts. Rhett was just trying to spoil her love. 
He was trying to tear down what was most precious to her. Some day, she thought viciously, when the store was on its feet and the mill doing nicely and she had money, she would make Rhett Butler pay for the misery and humiliation he was causing her. He was standing over her, looking down at her, faintly amused. The emotion which had stirred him was gone. What does it all matter to you anyway? she asked. It's my business and Ashley's, not yours. He shrugged. Only this. I have a deep and impersonal admiration for your endurance, Scarlet. And I do not like to see your spirit crushed beneath too many millstones. There's Tara. That's a man-sized job in itself. There's your sick father added on. He'll never be any help to you. And the girls and the darkies. And now you've taken on a husband and probably Miss Pittypat, too. You have enough burdens without Ashley Wilkes and his family on your hands. He's not on my hands. He helps. Oh, for God's sake, he said impatiently. Don't let's have any more of that. He's no help. He's on your hands and he'll be on them. Or on somebody's till he dies. Personally, I'm sick of him as a topic of conversation. How much money do you want? The tuperative words rushed to her lips. After all his insults. After dragging from her those things which were most precious to her and trampling on them. He still thought she would take his money. But the words were checked unspoken. How wonderful it would be to scorn his offer and order him out of the store. But only the truly rich and the truly secure could afford this luxury. So long as she was poor, just so long would she have to endure such scenes as this. But when she was rich, oh, what a beautiful warming thought that was. When she was rich, she wouldn't stand anything she didn't like, do without anything she desired, or even be polite to people unless they pleased her. I shall tell them all to go to Halifax, she thought, and Rhett Butler will be the first one. The pleasure in the thought brought a sparkle into her green eyes and a half-smile to her lips. Rhett smiled, too. You're a pretty person, Scarlet, he said. Especially when you are meditating devilment. And just for the sight of that dimple, I'll buy you a baker's dozen of mules if you want them. The front door opened, and the counterboy entered, picking his teeth with a quill. Scarlet rose, pulled her shawl about her, and tied her bonnet strings firmly under her chin. Her mind was made up. Are you busy this afternoon? Can you come with me now? she asked. Where? I want you to drive to the mill with me. I promised Frank I wouldn't drive out of town by myself. To the mill? In this rain? Yes. I want to buy that mill now before you change your mind. He laughed so loudly the boy behind the counter started and looked at him curiously. Have you forgotten you're married? Mrs. Kennedy can't afford to be seen driving out into the country with that butler reprobate who isn't received in the best parlors. Have you forgotten your reputation? Reputation, fiddly-dee. I want that mill before you change your mind, or Frank finds out that I'm buying it. Don't be a slowpoke, Rhett. What's a little rain? Let's hurry. That sawmill. Frank groaned every time he thought of it, cursing himself for ever mentioning it to her. It was bad enough for her to sell her earrings to Captain Butler, of all people, and buy the mill without even consulting her own husband about it. But it was worse still that she didn't turn it over to him to operate. That looked bad, as if she didn't trust him or his judgment. Frank, in common with all men he knew, felt that a wife should be guided by her husband's superior knowledge, should accept his opinions in full and have none of her own. He would have given most women their own way. Women were such funny little creatures, and it never hurt to humor their small whims. Mild and gentle by nature, it was not in him to deny a wife much. 
He would have enjoyed gratifying the foolish notions of some soft little person and scolding her lovingly for her stupidity and extravagance. But the things Scarlet set her mind on were unthinkable. That sawmill, for example. It was the shock of his life when she told him with a sweet smile, in answer to his questions, that she intended to run it herself. Go into the lumber business myself, was the way she put it. Frank would never forget the horror of that moment. Go into business for herself. It was unthinkable. There were no women in business in Atlanta. In fact, Frank had never heard of a woman in business anywhere. If women were so unfortunate as to be compelled to make a little money to assist their families in these hard times, they made it in quiet, womanly ways. Baking, as Mrs. Merriweather was doing, or painting china and sewing and keeping boarders like Mrs. Elsing and Fanny, or teaching school like Mrs. Mead, or giving music lessons like Mrs. Bunnell. These ladies made money, but they kept themselves at home while they did it, as a woman should. But for a woman to leave the protection of her home and venture out into the rough world of men, competing with them in business, rubbing shoulders with them, being exposed to insult and gossip, especially when she wasn't forced to do it, when she had a husband amply able to provide for her. Frank had hoped she was only teasing or playing a joke on him, a joke of questionable taste, but he soon found out she meant what she said. She did operate the sawmill. She rose earlier than he did to drive out Peachtree Road and frequently didn't come home until long after he had locked up the store and returned to Aunt Pity's for supper. She drove the long miles to the mill with only the disapproving Uncle Peter to protect her, and the woods were full of free niggers and Yankee riffraff. Frank couldn't go with her. The store took all of his time. But when he protested, she said shortly, If I don't keep an eye on that slick scamp Johnson, he'll steal my lumber and sell it and put the money in his pocket. When I can get a good man to run the mill for me, then I won't have to go out there so often. Then I can spend my time in town selling lumber. Selling lumber in town? That was the worst of all. She frequently did take a day off from the mill and peddle lumber, and on those days Frank wished he could hide in the dark back room of his store and see no one. His wife selling lumber. And people were talking terribly about her, probably about him, too, for permitting her to behave in so unwomanly a fashion. It embarrassed him to face his customers over the counter and hear them say, I saw Mrs. Kennedy a few minutes ago over at the... Everyone took pains to tell him what she did. Everyone was talking about what happened over where the new hotel was being built. Scarlet had driven up just as Tommy Welburn was buying some lumber from another man, and she climbed down out of the buggy among the rough Irish masons who were laying the foundations and told Tommy briefly that he was being cheated. She said her lumber was better and cheaper, too. And to prove it, she ran up a long column of figures in her head and gave him an estimate then and there. It was bad enough that she had intruded herself among strange, rough workmen, but it was still worse for a woman to show publicly that she could do mathematics like that. When Tommy accepted her estimate and gave her the order, Scarlet hadn't taken her departure speedily and meekly, but had idled about, talking to Johnny Gallagher, the foreman of the Irish workers, a hard-bitten little gnome of a man who had a very bad reputation. The town talked about it for weeks. On top of everything else, she was actually making money out of the mill, and no man could feel right about a wife who succeeded in so unwomanly an activity. Nor did she turn over the money or any part of it to him to use in the store. Most of it went to Tara, and she wrote interminable letters to Will Benteen telling him just how it should be spent. Furthermore, she told Frank that if the repairs at Terra could ever be completed, she intended to lend out her money on mortgages. My, my, moaned Frank whenever he thought of this. A woman had no business even knowing what a mortgage was. Scarlet was full of plans these days, 
and each one of them seemed worse to Frank than the previous one. She even talked of building a saloon on the property where her warehouse had been until Sherman burned it. Frank was no teetotaler, but he feverishly protested against the idea. Owning saloon property was a bad business, an unlucky business, almost as bad as renting to a house of prostitution. Just why it was bad, he couldn't explain to her, and to his lame argument she said, Fiddle-dee-dee! Saloons are always good tenants. Uncle Henry said so, she told him. They always pay their rent, and look here, Frank, I could put up a cheap saloon out of poor grade lumber I can't sell and get good rent for it. And with the rent money and the money from the mill and what I could get from mortgages, I could buy some more sawmills. Sugar, you don't need any more sawmills, cried Frank, appalled. What you ought to do is sell the one you've got. It's wearing you out, and you know what trouble you have keeping free darkies at work there. Free darkies are certainly worthless, Scarlet agreed, completely ignoring his hint that she should sell. Mr. Johnson says he never knows when he comes to work in the morning whether he'll have a full crew or not. You just can't depend on the darkies any more. They work a day or two, and then they lay off till they've spent their wages, and the whole crew is like as not to quit overnight. The more I see of emancipation, the more criminal I think it is. It's just ruined the darkies. Thousands of them aren't working at all, and the ones we can get to work at the mill are so lazy and shiftless they aren't worth having. And if you so much as swear at them, much less hit them a few licks for the good of their souls... The Freedmen's Bureau is down on you like a duck on a June bug. Sugar, you aren't letting Mr. Johnson beat those. Of course not, she returned impatiently. Didn't I just say the Yankees would put me in jail if I did? I'll bet your pa never hit a darky a lick in his life, said Frank. Well, only one. A stable boy who didn't rub down his horse after a day's hunt. But Frank, it was different then. Free issue niggers are something else, and a good whipping would do some of them a lot of good. Frank was not only amazed at his wife's views and her plans, but at the change which had come over her in the few months since their marriage. This wasn't the soft, sweet, feminine person he had taken to wife. In the brief period of the courtship, he thought he had never known a woman more attractively feminine in her reactions to life ignorant, timid, and helpless. Now her reactions were all masculine. Despite her pink cheeks and dimples and pretty smiles, she talked and acted like a man. Her voice was brisk and decisive, and she made up her mind instantly and with no girlish shilly-shallying. She knew what she wanted, and she went after it by the shortest route, like a man not by the hidden and circuitous routes peculiar to women. It was not that Frank had never seen commanding women before this. Atlanta, like all southern towns, had its share of dowagers whom no one cared to cross. No one could be more dominating than stout Mrs. Merriweather, more imperious than frail Mrs. Elsing, more artful in securing her own ends than the silver-haired, sweet-voiced Mrs. Whiting. But no matter what devices these ladies employed in order to get their own way, they were always feminine devices. They made a point of being deferential to men's opinions, whether they were guided by them or not. They had the politeness to appear to be guided by what men said, and that was what mattered. But Scarlet was guided by no one but herself and was conducting her affairs in a masculine way which had the whole town talking about her. And, thought Frank miserably, probably talking about me, too, for letting her act so unwomanly. Then there was that butler man. His frequent calls at Aunt Pity's house were the greatest humiliation of all. Frank had always disliked him, even when he had done business with him before the war. He often cursed the day he had brought Rhett to Twelve Oaks and introduced him to his friends. 
He despised him for the cold-blooded way he had acted in his speculations during the war, and for the fact that he hadn't been in the army. Rhett's eight-month service with the Confederacy was known only to Scarlet, for Rhett had begged her, with mock fear, not to reveal his shame to anyone. Most of all, Frank had contempt for him for holding on to the Confederate gold. When honest men like Admiral Bullock and others confronted with the same situation had turned back thousands to the Federal Treasury. But whether Frank liked it or not, Rhett was a frequent caller. Ostensibly, it was Miss Pity he came to see, and she had no better sense than to believe it and give herself airs over his visits. But Frank had an uncomfortable feeling that Miss Pity was not the attraction which brought him. Little Wade was very fond of him, though the boy was shy of most people, and even called him Uncle Rhett, which annoyed Frank. And Frank couldn't help remembering that Rhett had squired Scarlet about during the war days, and there had been talk about them then. He imagined there might be even worse talk about them now. None of his friends had the courage to mention anything of this sort to Frank, for all their outspoken words on Scarlet's conduct in the matter of the mill. But he couldn't help noticing that he and Scarlet were less frequently invited to meals and parties, and fewer and fewer people came to call on them. Scarlet disliked most of her neighbors and was too busy with her mill to care about seeing the ones she did like, so the lack of calls didn't disturb her. But Frank felt it keenly. All of his life, Frank had been under the domination of the phrase, What will the neighbors say? And he was defenseless against the shocks of his wife's repeated disregard of the proprieties. He felt that everyone disapproved of Scarlet and was contemptuous of him for permitting her to unsex herself. She did so many things a husband shouldn't permit, according to his views, but if he ordered her to stop them, argued, or even criticized, a storm broke on his head. My, my, he thought helplessly. She can get mad quicker and stay mad longer than any woman I ever saw. Even at the times when things were most pleasant, it was amazing how completely and how quickly the teasing, affectionate wife who hummed to herself as she went about the house could be transformed into an entirely different person. He had only to say, Sugar, if I were you, I wouldn't, and the tempest would break. Her black brows rushed together to meet in a sharp angle over her nose, and Frank cowered almost visibly. She had the temper of a tartar and the rages of a wildcat, and at such times she didn't seem to care what she said or how much it hurt. Clouds of gloom hung over the house on such occasions. Frank went early to the store and stayed late. Pity scrambled into her bedroom like a rabbit panting for its burrow. Wade and Uncle Peter retired to the carriage house, and Cookie kept to her kitchen and forbore to raise her voice to praise the Lord in song. Only Mammy endured Scarlet's temper with equanimity, and Mammy had had many years of training with Gerald O'Hara and his explosions. Scarlet didn't mean to be short-tempered, and she really wanted to make Frank a good wife, for she was fond of him and grateful for his help in saving Tara. But he did try her patience to the breaking point so often and in so many different ways. She could never respect a man who let her run over him and the timid, hesitant attitude he displayed in any unpleasant situation with her or with others irritated her unbearably. But she could have overlooked these things and even been happy now that some of her money problems were being solved except for her constantly renewed exasperation growing out of the many incidents which showed that Frank was neither a good businessman nor did he want her to be a good businessman. As she expected, he had refused to collect the unpaid bills until she prodded him into it. And then he had done it apologetically and half-heartedly. 
That experience was the final evidence she needed to show her that the Kennedy family would never have more than a bare living, unless she personally made the money she was determined to have. She knew now that Frank would be contented to dawdle along with his dirty little store for the rest of his life. He didn't seem to realize what a slender finger hold they had on security, and how important it was to make more money in these troublous times when money was the only protection against fresh calamities. Frank might have been a successful businessman in the easy days before the war, but he was so annoyingly old-fashioned, she thought, and so stubborn about wanting to do things in the old ways, when the old ways and the old days were gone. He was utterly lacking in the aggressiveness needed in these new, bitter times. Well, she had the aggressiveness, and she intended to use it, whether Frank liked it or not. They needed money, and she was making money, and it was hard work. The very least Frank could do, in her opinion, was not to interfere with her plans, which were getting results. With her inexperience, operating the new mill was no easy job, and competition was keener now than it had been at first. So she was usually tired and worried and cross when she came home at nights. And when Frank would cough apologetically and say, Sugar, I wouldn't do this, or I wouldn't do that, Sugar, if I were you, it was all she could do to restrain herself from flying into a rage. And frequently she didn't restrain herself. If he didn't have the gumption to get out and make some money, why was he always finding fault with her? And the things he nagged her about were so silly. What difference did it make in times like these if she was being unwomanly? Especially when her unwomanly sawmill was bringing in money they needed so badly. She and the family and Tara, and Frank too. Frank wanted rest and quiet. The war in which he had served so conscientiously had wrecked his health cost him his fortune, and made him an old man. He regretted none of these things, and after four years of war, all he asked of life was peace and kindliness, loving faces about him and the approval of friends. He soon found that domestic peace had its price. And that price was letting Scarlet have her own way, no matter what she might wish to do. So, because he was tired, he bought peace at her own terms. Sometimes he thought it was worth it to have her smiling when she opened the front door in the cold twilights, kissing him on the ear or the nose or some other inappropriate place, to feel her head snuggling drowsily on his shoulder at night under warm quilts. Home life could be so pleasant when Scarlet was having her own way, but the peace he gained was hollow, only an outward semblance, for he had purchased it at the cost of everything he held to be right in married life. A woman ought to pay more attention to a home and a family and not be gadding about like a man, he thought. Now, if she just had a baby... He smiled when he thought of a baby... And he thought of a baby very often. Scarlet had been most outspoken about not wanting a child, but then baby seldom waited to be invited. Frank knew that many women said they didn't want babies, but that was all foolishness and fear. If Scarlet had a baby, she would love it and be content to stay home and tend it like other women. Then she would be forced to sell the mill and his problems would be ended. All women needed babies to make them completely happy, and Frank knew that Scarlet wasn't happy. Ignorant as he was of women, he wasn't so blind that he couldn't see she was unhappy at times. Sometimes he awoke at night and heard the soft sound of tears muffled in the pillow. The first time he had waked to feel the bed shaking with her sobbing, he had questioned in alarm, Sugar, what is it? and had been rebuked by a passionate cry. Oh, let me alone! Yes, a baby would make her happy, and would take her mind off things she had no business fooling with. 
Sometimes Frank sighed, thinking he had caught a tropic bird, all flame and jewel color, when a wren would have served him just as well. Chapter 37 It was on a wild, wet night in April that Tony Fontaine rode in from Jonesboro on a lathered horse that was half dead from exhaustion and came knocking up their door, rousing her and Frank from sleep with their hearts in their throats. Then for the second time in four months, Scarlet was made to feel acutely what reconstruction in all its implications meant made to understand more completely what it was in Will's mind when he said, Our troubles have just begun. To know that the bleak words of Ashley spoken in the windswept orchard of Tara were true. This that's facing all of us is worse than war, worse than prison, worse than death. The first time she had come face to face with Reconstruction was when she learned that Jonas Wilkerson, with the aid of the Yankees, could evict her from Terra. But Tony's advent brought it all home to her in a far more terrifying manner. Tony came in the dark and the lashing rain, and in a few minutes he was gone back into the night forever. But in the brief interval between, he raised the curtain on a scene of new horror a curtain that she felt hopelessly would never be lowered again. That stormy night, when the knocker hammered on the door with such hurried urgency, she stood on the landing, clutching her wrapper to her, and looking down into the hall below, had one glimpse of Tony's swarthy saturnine face before he leaned forward and blew out the candle in Frank's hand. She hurried down in the darkness to grasp his cold, wet hand and heard him whisper, They're after me, going to Texas. My horse is about dead, and I'm about starved. Ashley said, You don't light the candle. Don't wait the darkies. I don't want to get you folks in trouble if I can help it. With the kitchen blinds drawn and all the shades pulled down to the sills, he permitted a light and he talked to Frank in swift, jerky sentences as Scarlet hurried about, trying to scrape together a meal for him. He was without a greatcoat and soaked to the skin. He was hatless, and his black hair was plastered to his little skull. But the merriment of the Fontaine boys, a chilling merriment that night, was in his little dancing eyes as he gulped down the whiskey she brought him. Scarlet thanked God that Aunt Pitypat was snoring undisturbed upstairs. She would certainly swoon if she saw this apparition. One damn bass scalawag less, said Tony, holding out his glass for another drink. I've ridden hard, and it'll cost me my skin if I don't get out of here quick. But it was worth it. By God, yes. I'm going to try to get to Texas and lay low there. Ashley was with me in Jonesboro, and he told me to come to you all. Got to have another horse, Frank, and some money. My horse is nearly dead, all the way up here at a dead run. And like a fool, I went out of the house today like a bat out of hell without a coat or a hat or a cent of money. Not that there's much money in our house. He laughed and applied himself hungrily to the cold corn pone and cold turnip greens on which congealed grease was thick in white flakes. You can have my horse, said Frank calmly. I've only ten dollars with me, but if you can wait till morning... Hell's a fire! I can't wait, said Tony emphatically but jovially. They're probably right behind me. I didn't get much of a start. If it hadn't been for Ashley dragging me out of there and making me get on my horse, I'd have stayed there like a fool and probably had my neck stretched by now. Good fellow, Ashley. So Ashley was mixed up in this frightening puzzle. Scarlet went cold, her hand at her throat. Did the Yankees have Ashley now? Why? Why didn't Frank ask what it was all about? Why did he take it all so coolly, so much as a matter of course? 
She struggled to get the question to her lips. What? She began. Who? Your father's old overseer, that damned Jonas Wilkerson. Did you... Is he dead? My God, Scarlet O'Hara, said Tony peevishly. When I start out to cut somebody up, you don't think I'd be satisfied with scratching him with the blunt side of my knife, do you? No, by God, I cut him to ribbons. Good, said Frank casually. I never liked the fellow. Scarlet looked at him. This was not the meek Frank she knew. The nervous beard clawer who she had learned could be bullied with such ease. There was an air about him that was crisp and cool, and he was meeting the emergency with no unnecessary words. He was a man, and Tony was a man, and this situation of violence was men's business in which a woman had no part. But Ashley, did he... No. He wanted to kill him, but I told him it was my right, because Sally is my sister-in-law, and he saw reason, finally. He went into Jonesboro with me in case Wilkerson got me first. But I don't think old Ash will get into any trouble about it. I hope not. Got any jam for this corn pone? And can you wrap me up something to take with me? I shall scream if you don't tell me everything. Wait till I've gone and then scream if you've got to. I'll tell you about it while Frank saddles the horse. That damned Wilkerson has caused enough trouble already. You know how he did you about your taxes. That's just one of his meannesses. But the worst thing was the way he kept the darkies stirred up. If anybody had told me I'd ever live to see the day when I'd hate darkies... Damn their black souls. They believe anything those scoundrels tell them and forget every living thing we've done for them. Now the Yankees are talking about letting the darkies vote. And they won't let us vote. Why, there's hardly a handful of Democrats in the whole county who aren't barred from voting now that they've ruled out every man who fought in the Confederate Army. And if they give the Negroes the vote, it's the end of us. Damn it, it's our state. It doesn't belong to the Yankees. By God, Scarlet, it isn't to be born. And it won't be born. We'll do something about it if it means another war. Soon we'll be having nigger judges, nigger legislators, black apes out of the jungle. Please, hurry, tell me, what did you do? Give me another mite of that poem before you wrap it up. Well, the word got around that Wilkerson had gone a bit too far with his nigger equality business. Oh, yes, he talks it to those black fools by the hour. He had the gall, the... Tony sputtered helplessly to say niggers had a right to... to... white women. Oh, Tony, no. My God, yes. I don't wonder you look sick. But hell's a fire, Scarlet. It can't be news to you. They've been telling it to them here in Atlanta... I didn't know. Well, Frank would have kept it from you. Anyway, after that, we all sort of thought we'd call on Mr. Wilkerson privately by night and tend to him, but before we could... You remember that black buck Eustace who used to be our foreman? Yes. Came to the kitchen door today while Sally was fixing dinner, and I don't know what he said to her. I guess I'll never know now. But he said something, and I heard her scream, and I ran into the kitchen, and there he was, drunk as a fiddler's bitch. I beg your pardon, Scarlet. It just slipped out. Go on. I shot him. And when Mother ran in to take care of Sally, I got my horse and started to Jonesboro for Wilkerson. He was the one to blame. The damn black fool would never have thought of it but for him. And on the way past Tara, I met Ashley, and of course he went with me. He said to let him do it because of the way Wilkerson acted about Tara, and I said, no, it was my place because Sally was my own dead brother's wife. And he went with me arguing the whole way. And when we got to town, by God, Scarlet, do you know I hadn't even brought my pistol? I'd left it in the stable. So mad, I forgot. He paused and gnawed the tough pone, and Scarlet shivered. The murderous rages of the Fontaines had made county history long before this chapter had opened. So I had to take my knife to him. I found him in the bar room. 
I got him in a corner with Ashley holding back the others, and I told him why before I let into him. Why it was over before I knew it, said Tony, reflecting. First thing I knew, Ashley had me on my horse and told me to come to you folks. Ashley's a good man in a pinch. He keeps his head. Frank came in, his great coat over his arm, and handed it to Tony. It was his only heavy coat, but Scarlet made no protest. She seemed so much on the outside of this affair, this purely masculine affair. But, Tony, they need you at home. Surely, if you went back and explained. Frank, you've married a fool, said Tony with a grin, struggling into the coat. She thinks the Yankees will reward a man for keeping niggers off his women folks. So they will, with a drumhead court and a rope. Give me a kiss, Scarlet. Frank won't mind, and I may never see you again. Texas is a long way off. I won't dare write. So let the home folks know I got this far in safety. She let him kiss her, and the two men went out into the driving rain and stood for a moment, talking on the back porch. Then she heard a sudden splashing of hooves, and Tony was gone. She opened the door a crack and saw Frank leading a heaving, stumbling horse into the carriage house. She shut the door again and sat down, her knees trembling. Now she knew what reconstruction meant, knew as well as if the house were ringed about by naked savages squatting in breech clouts. Now there came rushing to her mind many things to which she had given little thought recently, conversation she had heard but to which she had not listened, masculine talk which had been checked half-finished when she came into rooms, small incidents in which she had seen no significance at the time, Frank's futile warnings to her against driving out to the mill with only the feeble Uncle Peter to protect her. Now they fitted themselves together into one horrifying picture. The Negroes were on top, and behind them were the Yankee bayonets. She could be killed. She could be raped, and very probably nothing would ever be done about it. And anyone who avenged her would be hanged by the Yankees, hanged without benefit of trial by judge and jury. Yankee officers who knew nothing of law and cared less for the circumstances of the crime could go through the motions of holding a trial and put a rope around a southerner's neck. What can we do? she thought, wringing her hands in an agony of helpless fear. What can we do with devils who'd hang a nice boy like Tony just for killing a drunken buck and a scoundrelly scalawag to protect his women folks? It isn't to be born, Tony had cried. And he was right. It couldn't be born. But what could they do except bear it, helpless as they were? She fell to trembling, and for the first time in her life, she saw people and events as something apart from herself, saw clearly that Scarlet O'Hara, frightened and helpless, was not all that mattered. There were thousands of women like her all over the South, who were frightened and helpless, and thousands of men who had laid down their arms at Appomattox, had taken them up again and stood ready to risk their necks on a minute's notice to protect those women. There had been something in Tony's face which had been mirrored in Frank's, an expression she had seen recently on the faces of other men in Atlanta, a look she had noticed but had not troubled to analyze. It was an expression vastly different from the tired helplessness she had seen in the faces of men coming home from the war after the surrender. Those men had not cared about anything except getting home. Now they were caring about something again. Numbed nerves were coming back to life, and the old spirit was beginning to burn. They were caring again with a cold, ruthless bitterness. And like Tony, they were thinking... It isn't to be born. She had seen southern men, soft-voiced and dangerous in the days before the war, reckless and hard in the last despairing days of the fighting. 
But in the faces of the two men who stared at each other across the candle flame so short a while ago, there had been something that was different. Something that heartened her, but frightened her. Fury which could find no words. Determination which would stop at nothing. For the first time, she felt a kinship with the people about her. Felt one with them in their fears, their bitterness, their determination. No, it wasn't to be born. The South was too beautiful a place to be let go without a struggle, too loved to be trampled by Yankees who hated Southerners enough to enjoy grinding them into the dirt, too dear a homeland to be turned over to ignorant Negroes drunk with whiskey and freedom. She thought of Tony's sudden entrance and swift exit. She felt herself akin to him, for she remembered the old story of how her father had left Ireland, left hastily and by night, after a murder which was no murder to him or to his family. Gerald's blood was in her. Violent blood. She remembered her hot joy in shooting the marauding Yankee. Violent blood was in them all, perilously close to the surface, lurking just beneath the kindly, courteous exteriors. All of them, all the men she knew, even the drowsy-eyed Ashley and fidgety old Frank, were like that underneath. Murderous, violent if the need arose. Even Rhett, conscienceless scamp that he was, had killed a Negro for being uppity to a lady. When Frank came in dripping with rain and coughing, she leaped to her feet. Oh, Frank, how long will it be like this? As long as the Yankees hate us so, sugar. Is there nothing anybody can do? Frank passed a tired hand over his wet beard. We are doing things. What? Why talk of them till we have accomplished something? It may take years. Perhaps, perhaps the self will always be like this. Oh, no. Sugar, come to bed. You must be chilled. You're shaking. When will it all end? When we can all vote again, Sugar. When every man who fought for the South can put a ballot in the box for a Southerner and a Democrat. A ballot? She cried despairingly. What good's a ballot when the darkies have lost their minds? When the Yankees have poisoned them against us? Frank went on to explain in his patient manner, but the idea that ballots could cure the trouble was too complicated for her to follow. She was thinking gratefully that Jonas Wilkerson would never again be a menace to Tara. And she was thinking about Tony. Oh, the poor Fontaines, she exclaimed. Only Alex left and so much to do at Mimosa. Why didn't Tony have the sense enough to... To do it at night when no one would know who it was. A sight more good he'd do helping with the spring plowing than in Texas. Frank put an arm about her. Usually he was gingerly when he did this, as if he anticipated being impatiently shaken off. But tonight there was a far-off look in his eyes, and his arm was firm about her waist. There are things more important now than plowing sugar and scaring the darkies and teaching the scalawags a lesson is one of them. As long as there are fine boys like Tony left, I guess we won't need to worry about the South too much. Come to bed. But, Frank, if we just stand together and don't give an inch to the Yankees, we'll win some day. Don't you bother your pretty head about it, sugar. You let your men folks worry about it. Maybe it won't come in our time, but surely it will come some day. The Yankees will get tired of pestering us when they see they can't even dent us. And then we'll have a decent world to live in and raise our children in. She thought of Wade and the secret she had carried silently for some days. No. She didn't want her children raised in this welter of hate and uncertainty, of bitterness and violence lurking just below the surface, of poverty and grinding hardships and insecurity. 
She never wanted children of hers to know what all this was like. She wanted a secure and well-ordered world in which she could look forward and know there was a safe future ahead for them, a world where her children would know only softness and warmth and good clothes and fine food. Frank thought this could be accomplished by voting. Voting? What did votes matter? Nice people in the South would never have the vote again. There was only one thing in the world that was a certain bulwark against any calamity which fate could bring, and that was money. She thought feverishly that they must have money, lots of it to keep them safe against disaster. Abruptly, she told him she was going to have a baby. For weeks after Tony's escape, Aunt Pity's house was subjected to repeated searches by parties of Yankee soldiers. They invaded the house at all hours and without warning. They swarmed through the rooms, asking questions, opening closets, prodding clothes hampers, peering under beds. The military authorities had heard that Tony had been advised to go to Miss Pity's house, and they were certain he was still hiding there or somewhere in the neighborhood. As a result, Aunt Pity was chronically in what Uncle Peter called a state, never knowing when her bedroom would be entered by an officer and a squad of men. Neither Frank nor Scarlet had mentioned Tony's brief visit, so the old lady could have revealed nothing, even had she been so inclined. She was entirely honest in her fluttery protestations, that she had seen Tony Fontaine only once in her life, and that was at Christmas time in 1862. And, she would add breathlessly to the Yankee soldiers in an effort to be helpful, he was quite intoxicated at the time. Scarlet, sick and miserable in the early stage of pregnancy, alternated between a passionate hatred of the bluecoats who invaded her privacy, frequently carrying away any little knick-knack that appealed to them, and an equally passionate fear that Tony might prove the undoing of them all. The prisons were full of people who had been arrested for much less reason. She knew that if one iota of the truth were proved against them, not only she and Frank, but the innocent pity as well would go to jail. For some time there had been an agitation in Washington to confiscate all rebel property, to pay the United States war debt and this agitation had kept Scarlet in a state of anguished apprehension. Now, in addition to this, Atlanta was full of wild rumors about the confiscation of property of offenders against military law, and Scarlet quaked lest she and Frank lose not only their freedom, but the house, the store, and the mill. And even if their property were not appropriated by the military, it would be as good as lost if she and Frank went to jail. For who would look after their business in their absence? She hated Tony for bringing such trouble upon them. How could he have done such a thing to friends? And how could Ashley have sent Tony to them? Never again would she give aid to anyone if it meant having the Yankees come down on her like a swarm of hornets. No, she would bar the door against anyone needing help, except, of course, Ashley. For weeks after Tony's brief visit, she woke from uneasy dreams at any sound in the road outside, fearing it might be Ashley trying to make his escape, fleeing to Texas because of the aid he had given Tony. She didn't know how matters stood with him, for they didn't dare write to Tara about Tony's midnight visit. Their letters might be intercepted by the Yankees and bring trouble upon the plantation as well. But when weeks went by and they heard no bad news... They knew that Ashley had somehow come clear. And finally, the Yankees ceased annoying them. But even this relief didn't free Scarlet from the state of dread which began when Tony came knocking at their door. A dread which was worse than the quaking fear of the seed shells. Worse even than the terror of Sherman's men during the last days of the war. 
It was as if Tony's appearance that wild, rainy night had stripped merciful blinders from her eyes and forced her to see the true uncertainty of her life. Looking about her that cold spring of 1866, Scarlet realized what was facing her and the whole South. She might plan and scheme. She might work harder than her slaves had ever worked. She might succeed in overcoming all of her hardships. She might, through dint of determination, solve problems for which her earlier life had provided no training at all. But for all her labor and sacrifice and resourcefulness, her small beginnings purchased at so great a cost might be snatched away from her at any minute. And should this happen, she had no legal rights, no legal redress, except those same drumhead courts of which Tony had spoken so bitterly, those military courts with their arbitrary powers. Only the Negroes had rights or redress these days. The Yankees had the South prostrate, and they intended to keep it so. The South had been tilted as by a giant malicious hand, and those who had once ruled were now more helpless than their former slaves had ever been. Georgia was heavily garrisoned with troops, and Atlanta had more than its share. The commandants of the Yankee troops in the various cities had complete power, even the power of life and death, over the civilian population, and they used that power. They could and did imprison citizens for any cause, or no cause, seize their property, hang them. They could and did harass and hamstring them with conflicting regulations about the operation of their business, the wages they must pay their servants, what they should say in public and private utterances, and what they should write in newspapers. They regulated how, when, and where they must dump their garbage, and they decided what songs the daughters and wives of ex-Confederates could sing, so that the singing of Dixie or Bonnie Blue Flag became an offense only a little less serious than treason. They ruled that no one could get a letter out of the post office without taking the ironclad oath, and in some instances they even prohibited the issuance of marriage licenses unless the couples had taken the hated oath. The newspapers were so muzzled that no public protests could be raised against the injustices or depredations of the military and individual protests were silenced with jail sentences. The jails were full of prominent citizens, and there they stayed without hope of early trial. Trial by jury and the law of habeas corpus were practically suspended. The civil courts still functioned after a fashion, but they functioned at the pleasure of the military, who could and did interfere with their verdicts, so that citizens so unfortunate as to get arrested were virtually at the mercy of the military authorities. And so many did get arrested. The very suspicion of seditious utterances against the government, suspected complicity in the Ku Klux Klan, or complaint by a Negro that a white man had been uppity to him, were enough to land a citizen in jail. Proof and evidence were not needed. The accusation was sufficient, and thanks to the incitement of the Freedmen's Bureau, Negroes could always be found who were willing to bring accusations. The Negroes had not yet been given the right to vote, but the North was determined that they should vote, and equally determined that their vote should be friendly to the North. With this in mind, nothing was too good for the Negroes. The Yankee soldiers backed them up in anything they chose to do, and the surest way for a white person to get himself in trouble was to bring a complaint of any kind against a Negro. The former slaves were now the lords of creation, and with the aid of the Yankees, the lowest and most ignorant ones were on top. The better class of them, scorning freedom, were suffering as severely as their white masters. Thousands of house servants, the highest caste in the slave population, remained with their white folks, doing manual labor which had been beneath them in the old days. 
Many loyal field hands also refused to avail themselves of the new freedom. But the hordes of trashy free-issue niggers, who were causing most of the trouble, were drawn largely from the field hand class. In slave days, these lowly blacks had been despised by the house negroes and yard negroes as creatures of small worth. Just as Ellen had done, other plantation mistresses throughout the South had put the pickaninnies through courses of training and elimination to select the best of them for the positions of greater responsibility. Those consigned to the fields were the ones least willing or able to learn, the least energetic, the least honest and trustworthy, the most vicious and brutish. And now this class, the lowest in the black social order, was making life a misery for the South. Aided by the unscrupulous adventurers who operated the Freedmen's Bureau and urged on by a fervor of northern hatred almost religious in its fanaticism, the former field hands found themselves suddenly elevated to the seats of the mighty. There they conducted themselves as creatures of small intelligence might naturally be expected to do like monkeys or small children turned loose among treasured objects whose value is beyond their comprehension, they ran wild, either from perverse pleasure in destruction or simply because of their ignorance. To the credit of the Negroes, including the least intelligent of them, few were actuated by malice, and those few had usually been mean niggers even in slave days. But they were, as a class, childlike in mentality, easily led, and from long habit accustomed to taking orders. Formerly, their white masters had given the orders. Now they had a new set of masters, the bureau and the carpetbaggers. And their orders were, You're just as good as any white man, so act that way. Just as soon as you can vote the Republican ticket... You're going to have the white man's property. It's as good as yours now. Take it if you can get it. Dazzled by these tales, freedom became a never-ending picnic, a barbecue every day of the week, a carnival of idleness and theft and insolence. Country Negroes flocked into the cities, leaving the rural districts without labor to make the crops. Atlanta was crowded with them, and still they came by the hundreds, lazy and dangerous as a result of the new doctrines being taught them. Packed into squalid cabins, smallpox, typhoid, and tuberculosis broke out among them. Accustomed to the care of their mistresses when they were ill in slave days, they didn't know how to nurse themselves or their sick. Relying upon their masters in the old days to care for their aged and their babies... They now had no sense of responsibility for their helpless. And the Bureau was far too interested in political matters to provide the care the plantation owners had once given. Abandoned Negro children ran like frightened animals about the town until kind-hearted white people took them into their kitchens to raise. Aged country darkies, deserted by their children, Bewildered and panic-stricken in the bustling town, sat on the curbs and cried to the ladies who passed, Mistress, please, ma'am, write my old master down in Fayette County that eyes up here. He'll come take his old nigger home again. For God, I done got enough this freedom. The Freedmen's Bureau, overwhelmed by the numbers who poured in upon them, realized too late a part of the mistake and tried to send them back to their former owners. They told the Negroes that if they would go back, they would go as free workers, protected by written contracts specifying wages by the day. The old jockeys went back to the plantations gladly, making a heavier burden than ever on the poverty-stricken planters who had not the heart to turn them out. But the young ones remained in Atlanta. They didn't want to be workers of any kind anywhere. Why work when the belly is full? For the first time in their lives, the Negroes were able to get all the whiskey they might want, 
In slave days, it was something they never tasted except at Christmas, when each one received a drap along with his gift. Now they had not only the bureau agitators and the carpetbaggers urging them on, but the incitement of whiskey as well, and outrages were inevitable. Neither life nor property was safe from them, and the white people, unprotected by law, were terrorized. Men were insulted on the streets by drunken blacks. Houses and barns were burned at night. Horses and cattle and chickens stolen in broad daylight. Crimes of all varieties were committed, and few of the perpetrators were brought to justice. But these ignominies and dangers were as nothing compared with the perils of white women, many bereft by the war of male protection, who lived alone in the outlying districts and on lonely roads. It was the large number of outrages on women and the ever-present fear for the safety of their wives and daughters that drove southern men to cold and trembling fury and caused the Ku Klux Klan to spring up overnight. And it was against this nocturnal organization that the newspapers of the North cried out most loudly, never realizing the tragic necessity that brought it into being. The North wanted every member of the Ku Klux hunted down and hanged. Because they had dared take the punishment of crime into their own hands, at a time when the ordinary processes of law and order had been overthrown by the invaders... Here was the astonishing spectacle of half a nation attempting, at the point of bayonet, to force upon the other half the rule of Negroes, many of them scarcely one generation out of the African jungles. The vote must be given to them, but it must be denied to most of their former owners. The South must be kept down, and disfranchisement of the whites was one way to keep the South down. Most of those who had fought for the Confederacy, held office under it, or given aid and comfort to it, were not allowed to vote, had no choice in the selection of their public officials, and were wholly under the power of an alien rule. Many men, thinking soberly of General Lee's words and example, wished to take the oath, become citizens again, and forget the past. But they were not permitted to take it. Others, who were permitted to take the oath, hotly refused to do so, scorning to swear allegiance to a government which was deliberately subjecting them to cruelty and humiliation. Scarlet heard over and over until she could have screamed at the repetition. I'd have taken their damned oath right after the surrender if they'd acted decent. I can be restored to the Union, but by God, I can't be reconstructed into it. Through these anxious days and nights, Scarlet was torn with fear. The ever-present menace of lawless Negroes and Yankee soldiers preyed on her mind. The danger of confiscation was constantly with her, even in her dreams, and she dreaded worse terrors to come. Depressed by the helplessness of herself and her friends, of the whole South, it wasn't strange she often remembered during these days the words which Tony Fontaine had spoken so passionately. By God, Scarlet, it isn't... In spite of war, fire, and reconstruction, Atlanta had again become a boom town. In many ways, the place resembled the busy young city of the Confederacy's early days, the only trouble was that the soldiers crowding the streets were the wrong kind of uniforms. The money was in the hands of the wrong people, and the Negroes were living in leisure while their former masters struggled and starved. Underneath the surface were misery and fear, but all the outward appearances were those of a thriving town that was rapidly rebuilding from its ruins, a bustling, hurrying town. Atlanta, it seemed, must always be hurrying, no matter what its circumstances might be, Savannah, Charleston, Augusta, Richmond, New Orleans, would never hurry. It was ill-bred and Yankeefied to hurry. But in this period, Atlanta was more ill-bred and Yankeefied than it had ever been before or would ever be again. 
With new people thronging in from all directions, the streets were choked and noisy from morning till night. The shiny carriages of Yankee officers' wives and newly rich carpetbaggers splashed mud on the dilapidated buggies of the townspeople. And gaudy new homes of wealthy strangers crowded in among the sedate dwellings of older citizens. The war had definitely established the importance of Atlanta in the affairs of the South, and the hitherto obscure town was now known far and wide. The railroads for which Sherman had fought an entire summer and killed thousands of men were again stimulating the life of the city they had brought into being. Atlanta was again the center of activities for a wide region, as it had been before its destruction, and the town was receiving a great influx of new citizens, both welcome and unwelcome. Invading carpetbaggers made Atlanta their headquarters, and on the streets they jostled against representatives of the oldest families in the South, who were likewise newcomers in the town. Families from the country districts who had been burned out during Sherman's march and who could no longer make a living without the slaves to till the cotton had come to Atlanta to live. New settlers were coming in every day from Tennessee and the Carolinas, where the hand of Reconstruction lay even heavier than in Georgia. Many Irish and Germans who had been bounty men in the Union Army had settled in Atlanta after their discharge. The wives and families of the Yankee garrison, filled with curiosity about the South after four years of war, came to swell the population. Adventurers of every kind swarmed in, hoping to make their fortunes, and the Negroes from the country continued to come by the hundreds. The town was roaring, wide open like a frontier village, making no effort to cover its vices and sins. Saloons blossomed overnight, two and sometimes three in a block, and after nightfall the streets were full of drunken men, black and white, reeling from wall to curb and back again. Thugs, pickpockets, and prostitutes lurked in the unlit alleys and shadowy streets. Gambling houses ran full blast, and hardly a night passed without its shooting or cutting a fray. Respectable citizens were scandalized to find that Atlanta had a large and thriving red-light district, larger and more thriving than during the war. All night long, pianos jangled from behind drawn shades, and rowdy songs and laughter floated out, punctuated by occasional screams and pistol shots. The inmates of these houses were bolder than the prostitutes of the war days, and brazenly hung out of their windows and called to passers-by. And on Sunday afternoons, the handsome closed carriages of the madams of the district rolled down the main streets, filled with girls in their best finery, taking the air from behind lowered silk shades. Belle Watling was the most notorious of the madams. She had opened a new house of her own, a large two-story building that made neighboring houses in the district look like shabby rabbit warrens. There was a long bar room downstairs, elegantly hung with oil paintings, and a Negro orchestra played every night. The upstairs, so rumor said, was fitted out with the finest of plush upholstered furniture, heavy lace curtains, and imported mirrors in gilt frames. The dozen young ladies with whom the house was furnished were comely, if brightly painted, and comported themselves more quietly than those of other houses. At least, the police were seldom summoned to bells. This house was something that the matrons of Atlanta whispered about furtively, and ministers preached against in guarded terms as a cesspool of iniquity, a hissing and a reproach. Everyone knew that a woman of Bell's type couldn't have made enough money by herself to set up such a luxurious establishment. She had to have a backer, and a rich one at that. And Rhett Butler had never had the decency to conceal his relations with her, so it was obvious that he and no other must be that backer. Belle herself presented a prosperous appearance when glimpsed occasionally in her closed carriage, driven by an impudent yellow negro. When she drove by, 
behind a fine pair of bays. All the little boys along the street, who could evade their mothers, ran to peer at her and whisper excitedly, That's her. That's old Belle. I've seen her red hair. Shouldering the shell-pitted houses patched with bits of old lumber and smoke-blackened bricks, the fine homes of the carpetbaggers and war profiteers were rising, with mansard roofs, gables and turrets, stained-glass windows and wide lawns. Night after night, in these newly built homes, the windows were ablaze with gaslight, and the sound of music and dancing feet drifted out upon the air. Women in stiff, bright-colored silk strolled about long verandas, squired by men in evening clothes. Champagne corks popped, and on lace tablecloths seven-course dinners were laid. Hams in wine, pressed duck, pâté de foie gras, Rare fruits in and out of season were spread in profusion. Behind the shabby doors of the old houses, poverty and hunger lived, all the more bitter for the brave gentility with which they were born, all the more pinching for the outward show of proud indifference to material wants. Dr. Mead could tell unlovely stories of those families who had been driven from mansions to boarding houses, and from boarding houses to dingy rooms on back streets. He had too many lady patients who were suffering from weak hearts and declines. He knew, and they knew he knew, that slow starvation was the trouble. He could tell of consumption making inroads on entire families, and of pellagra once found only among poor whites, which was now appearing in Atlanta's best families. And there were babies with thin, rickety legs and mothers who could not nurse them. Once the old doctor had been wont to thank God reverently for each child he brought into the world. Now he didn't think life was such a boon. It was a hard world for little babies, and so many died in their first few months of life. Bright lights and wine, fiddles and dancing, brocade and broadcloth in the showy big houses, and just around the corners, slow starvation and cold. Arrogance and callousness for the conquerors, bitter endurance and hatred for the conquered. Chapter 38 Scarlet saw it all, lived with it by day, took it to bed with her at night, dreading always what might happen next. She knew that she and Frank were already in the Yankees' black books because of Tony, and disaster might descend on them at any hour. But now, of all times, she couldn't afford to be pushed back to her beginnings, not now with a baby coming the mill just commencing to pay and Tara depending on her for money until the cotton came in in the fall. Oh, suppose she should lose everything. Suppose she should have to start all over again with only her puny weapons against this mad world, to have to pit her red lips and green eyes and her shrewd, shallow brain against the Yankees and everything the Yankees stood for. Weary with dread, she felt that she would rather kill herself than try to make a new beginning. In the ruin and chaos of that spring of 1866, she single-mindedly turned her energies to making the mill pay. There was money in Atlanta. The wave of rebuilding was giving her the opportunity she wanted, and she knew she could make money if only she could stay out of jail. But she told herself time and again she would have to walk easily, gingerly, be meek under insults, yielding to injustices, never giving offense to anyone, black or white, who might do her harm. She hated the impudent free Negroes as much as anyone, and her flesh crawled with fury every time she heard their insulting remarks and high-pitched laughter as she went by. But she never even gave them a glance of contempt. She hated the carpetbaggers and scalawags who were getting rich with ease while she struggled, but she said nothing in condemnation of them. No one in Atlanta could have loathed the Yankees more than she, 
for the very sight of a blue uniform made her sick with rage, but even in the privacy of her family she kept silent about them. I won't be a big-mouthed fool, she thought grimly. Let others break their hearts over the old days and the men who will never come back. Let others burn with fury over the Yankee rule and losing the ballot. Let others go to jail for speaking their minds and get themselves hanged for being in the Ku Klux Klan. Oh, what a dreaded name that was, almost as terrifying to Scarlet as to the Negroes. Let other women be proud that their husbands belonged. Thank God Frank had never been mixed up in it. Let others stew and fume and plot and plan about things they could not help. What did the past matter compared with the tense present and the dubious future? What did the ballot matter when bread, a roof, and staying out of jail were the real problems? And please, God, just let me stay out of trouble until June. Only till June. By that month, Scarlet knew she would be forced to retire into Aunt Pity's house and remain secluded there until after her child was born. Already people were criticizing her for appearing in public when she was in such a condition. No lady ever showed herself when she was pregnant. Already Frank and Pity were begging her not to expose herself, and them, to embarrassment. And she had promised them to stop work in June. Only till June. By June she must have the mill well enough established for her to leave it. By June she must have money enough to give her at least some little protection against misfortune. So much to do and so little time to do it. She wished for more hours of the day and counted the minutes. And she strained forward feverishly in her pursuit of money and still more money. Because she nagged the timid Frank. The store was doing better now, and he was even collecting some of the old bills. But it was the sawmill on which her hopes were pinned. Atlanta these days was like a giant plant which had been cut to the ground, but now was springing up again with sturdier shoots, thicker foliage, more numerous branches. The demand for building materials was far greater than could be supplied. Prices of lumber, brick, and stone soared, and Scarlet kept the mill running from dawn until lantern light. A part of every day she spent at the mill, prying into everything, doing her best to check the thievery she felt sure was going on. But most of the time she was riding about the town making the rounds of builders, contractors, and carpenters, even calling on strangers she had heard might build at future dates, cajoling them into promises of buying from her and her only. Soon she was a familiar sight on Atlanta streets, sitting in her buggy beside the dignified, disapproving old darky driver, a lap robe pulled high about her, her little mittened hands clasped in her lap. Aunt Pity made her a pretty green mantelette which hid her figure, and a green pancake hat which matched her eyes, and she always wore these becoming garments on her business calls. A faint dab of rouge on her cheeks and a fainter fragrance of cologne made her a charming picture, as long as she didn't alight from the buggy and show her figure. And there was seldom any need for this, for she smiled and beckoned and the men came quickly to the buggy and frequently stood bareheaded in the rain to talk business with her. She was not the only one who had seen the opportunities for making money out of lumber, but she didn't fear her competitors. She knew with conscious pride in her own smartness that she was the equal of any of them. She was Gerald's own daughter, and the shrewd trading instinct she had inherited was now sharpened by her needs. At first the other dealers had laughed at her, laughed with good-natured contempt at the very idea of a woman in business. But now they didn't laugh. They swore silently as they saw her ride by. The fact that she was a woman frequently worked in her favor, for she could upon occasion look so helpless and appealing that she melted hearts. With no difficulty whatever, she could mutely convey the impression of a brave but timid lady, forced by brutal circumstance into a distasteful position, a helpless little lady who would probably starve if customers didn't buy her lumber. 
But when ladylike airs failed to get results, she was coldly businesslike and willingly undersold her competitors at a loss to herself if it would bring her a new customer. She was not above selling a poor grade of lumber for the price of good lumber if she thought she would not be detected. And she had no scruples about blackguarding the other lumber dealers. With every appearance of reluctance at disclosing the unpleasant truth, she would sigh and tell prospective customers that her competitor's lumber was far too high in price, rotten, full of knot holes, and, in general, of deplorably poor quality. The first time Scarlet lied in this fashion, she felt disconcerted and guilty. Disconcerted because the lie sprang so easily and naturally to her lips. Guilty because the thought flashed into her mind, what would Mother say? There was no doubt what Ellen would say to a daughter who told lies and engaged in sharp practices. She would be stunned and incredulous and would speak gentle words that stung despite their gentleness, would talk of honor and honesty and truth and duty to one's neighbor. Momentarily, Scarlet cringed as she pictured the look on her mother's face, and then the picture faded, blotted out by an impulse, hard, unscrupulous, and greedy, which had been born in the lean days at Terra and was now strengthened by the present uncertainty of life. So she passed this milestone as she had passed others before it, with a sigh that she was not as Ellen would like her to be, a shrug, and the repetition of her unfailing charm, I'll think of all this later. But she never again thought of Ellen, in connection with her business practices. Never again regretted any means she used to take trade away from other lumber dealers. She knew she was perfectly safe in lying about them. Southern chivalry protected her. A southern lady could lie about a gentleman, but a southern gentleman could not lie about a lady, or worse still, call the lady a liar. Other lumbermen could only fume inwardly and state heatedly in the bosoms of their families that they wished to God Mrs. Kennedy was a man for just about five minutes. One poor white who operated a mill on the Decatur Road did try to fight Scarlet with her own weapons, saying openly that she was a liar and a swindler. But it hurt him rather than helped him for everyone was appalled that even a poor white should say such shocking things about a lady of good family, even when the lady was conducting herself in such an unwomanly way. Scarlet bore his remarks with silent dignity, and as time went by, she turned all her attention to him and his customers. She undersold him so relentlessly and delivered with secret groans such an excellent quality of lumber to prove her probity that he was soon bankrupt. Then, to Frank's horror, she triumphantly bought his mill at her own price. Once in her possession, there arose the perplexing problem of finding a trustworthy man to put in charge of it. She didn't want another man like Mr. Johnson. She knew that despite all her watchfulness, he was still selling her lumber behind her back. But she thought it would be easy to find the right sort of man. Wasn't everybody as poor as Job's turkey? And weren't the streets full of men, some of them formerly rich, who were without work? The day never went by that Frank didn't give money to some hungry ex-soldier, or that Pity and Cookie didn't wrap up food for gaunt beggars. But Scarlet, for some reason she couldn't understand, didn't want any of these. I don't want men who haven't found something to do after a year, she thought. If they haven't adjusted the piece yet, they couldn't adjust to me. And they all look so hangdog and licked. I don't want a man who's licked. I want somebody who's smart and energetic, like Rennie or Tommy Welburn, or Kells Whiting, or one of the Simmons boys, or, or any of that tribe. They haven't got that I-don't-care-about-anything look the soldiers had right after the surrender. They look like they cared a heap about a heap of things. But to her surprise, the Simmons boys, who had started a brick kill, and Kells Whiting, who was selling a preparation made up in his mother's kitchen, 
that was guaranteed to straighten the kinkiest negro hair in six applications, smiled politely, thanked her, and refused. It was the same with a dozen others she approached. In desperation she raised the wage she was offering, but she was still refused. One of Mrs. Merriweather's nephews observed impertinently that while he didn't especially enjoy driving a dray, it was his own dray, and he would rather get somewhere under his own steam than Scarlet's. One afternoon, Scarlet pulled up her buggy beside Rene Picard's pie wagon and hailed Rene and the crippled Tommy Welburn, who was catching a ride home with his friend. Look here, Rene, why don't you come and work for me? Managing a mill is a sight more respectable than driving a pie wagon. I think you'd be ashamed. Me? I am dead to shame, grinned Rene. Who would be respectable? All of my days I was respectable until the war set me free like the darkies. Never again must I be dignified and full of ennui, free like the bird. I like my pie wagon. I like my mule. I like the dear Yankees who so kindly buy the pie of Madame Belmere. No, my Scarlet, I must be the king of the pies. Eat is my destiny. Like Napoleon, I follow my star. He flourished his whip dramatically. But you weren't raised to sell pies any more than Tommy was raised to wrestle with a bunch of wild Irish masons. My kind of work is more... And I supposed you were raised to run a lumber mill, said Tommy, the corners of his mouth twitching. Yes, I can just see little Scarlet at her mother's knee, lisping her lesson. Never sell good lumber if you can get a better price for bad. Rene roared at this, his small monkey eyes dancing with glee as he whacked Tommy on his twisted back. Don't be impudent, said Scarlet coldly, for she saw little humor in Tommy's remark. Of course I wasn't raised to run a sawmill. I didn't mean to be impudent. But you are running a sawmill, whether you were raised to it or not, and running it very well, too. Well, none of us, as far as I can see, are doing what we intended to do right now, but I think we'll make out just the same. It's a poor person and a poor nation that sits down and cries because life isn't precisely what they expected it to be. Why don't you pick up some enterprising carpetbagger to work for you, Scarlet? The woods are full of them, God knows. I don't want a carpet bagger. Carpet baggers will steal anything that isn't red hot or nailed down. If they amounted to anything, they'd have stayed where they were instead of coming down here to pick our bones. I want a nice man from nice folks who's smart and honest and energetic and you don't want much. And you won't get it for the wage you're offering. All the men of that description, barring the badly maimed ones, have already got something to do. They may be round pegs in square holes, but they've all got something to do. Something of their own that they'd rather do than work for a woman. Men haven't got much sense, have they? When you get down to rock bottom. Maybe not. But they've got a heap of pride, said Tommy soberly. Pride? Pride tastes awfully good, especially when the crust is flaky and you put meringue on it, said Scarlet tartly. The two men laughed, a bit unwillingly. And it seemed to Scarlet that they drew together in united masculine disapproval of her. What Tommy said was true, she thought, running over in her mind the men she had approached and the ones she intended to approach. They were all busy, busy at something, working hard, working harder than they would have dreamed possible in the days before the war. They weren't doing what they wanted to do, perhaps, or what was easiest to do, or what they had been reared to do. But they were doing something. Times were too hard for men to be choosy, and if they were sorrowing for lost hopes, longing for lost ways of living, no one knew it but they. They were fighting a new war, a harder war than the one before. And they were caring about life again, Caring with the same urgency and the same violence that animated them before the war had cut their lives in two. 
Scarlet, said Tommy awkwardly. I do hate to ask a favor of you after being impudent to you, but I'm going to ask it just the same. Maybe it would help you anyway. My brother-in-law, Hugh Elsing, isn't doing any too well peddling kindling wood. Everybody except the Yankees goes out and collects his own kindling wood, and I know things are mighty hard with the whole Elsing family. I, I do what I can, but you see, I've got Fanny to support, and then... Two, I've got my mother and two widowed sisters down in Sparta to look after. He was nice, and he wanted a nice man, and he's from nice folks, as you know, and he's honest. But, well, Hugh hasn't got much gumption, or else he'd make a success of his kindling. Tommy shrugged. You've got a hard way of looking at things, Scarlet, he said. But you think Hugh over. You could go far and do worse. I think his honesty and his willingness will outweigh his lack of gumption. Scarlet didn't answer, for she didn't want to be rude. But to her mind there were few, if any, qualities that outweighed gumption. After she had unsuccessfully canvassed the town and refused the importuning of many eager carpetbaggers, she finally decided to take Tommy's suggestion and ask Hugh Elsing. He had been a dashing and resourceful officer during the war, but two severe wounds and four years of fighting seemed to have drained him of all his resourcefulness, leaving him to face the rigors of peace as bewildered as a child. There was a lost dog look in his eyes these days as he went about peddling his firewood, and he was not at all the kind of man she had hoped to get. He's stupid, she thought. He doesn't know a thing about business, and I'll bet he can't add two and two. And I doubt if he'll ever learn. But at least he's honest and won't swindle me. Scarlet had little use these days for honesty in herself. But the less she valued it in herself, the more she was beginning to value it in others. It's a pity Johnny Gallagher is tied up with Tommy Wilburn on that construction work, she thought. He's just the kind of man I want. He's hard as nails and slick as a snake. But he'd be honest if it paid him to be honest. I understand him, and he understands me, and we could do business together very well. Maybe I can get him when the hotel is finished. Until then, I'll have to make out on Hugh and Mr. Johnson. If I put Hugh in charge of the new mill and leave Mr. Johnson at the old one, I can stay in town and see to the selling while they handle the milling and the hauling. Until I can get Johnny, I'll have to risk Mr. Johnson robbing me if I stay in town all the time. If only he wasn't a thief. I believe I'll build a lumber yard on half that lot Charles left me. If only Frank didn't holler so loud about me building a saloon on the other half. Well, I shall build the saloon just as soon as I get enough money ahead, no matter how he takes on. If only Frank wasn't so thin-skinned. Oh, God, if only I wasn't going to have a baby at this of all times. In a little while I'll be so big I can't go out. Oh, God, if only I wasn't going to have a baby. And, oh, God, if the damn Yankees will only let me alone. If, 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 if. There were so many ifs in life. Never any certainty of anything. Never any sense of security. Always the dread of losing everything and being cold and hungry again. Of course, Frank was making a little more money now. But Frank was always ailing with colds and frequently forced to stay in bed for days. Suppose he should become an invalid. No, she could not afford to count on Frank for much. She must not count on anything or anybody but herself. And what she could earn seemed so pitiably small. Oh, what would she do if the Yankees came and took it all away from her? If, if, if. Half of what she made every month went to Will at Tara, part to Rhett to repay his loan, and the rest she hoarded. No miser ever counted his gold oftener than she, and no miser ever had greater fear of losing it. She wouldn't put the money in the bank, for it might fail, or the Yankees might confiscate it, so she carried what she could with her, tucked into her corset. 
and hid small wads of bills about the house, under loose bricks on the hearth, in her scrap bag, between the pages of the Bible. And her temper grew shorter and shorter as the weeks went by, for every dollar she saved would be just one more dollar to lose if disaster descended. Frank, Pity, and the servants bore her outbursts with maddening kindness, attributing her bad disposition to her pregnancy, never realizing the true cause. Frank knew that pregnant women must be humored, so he put his pride in his pocket and said nothing more about her running the mills and her going about town at such a time as no lady should do. Her conduct was a constant embarrassment to him, but he reckoned he could endure it for a while longer. After the baby came, he knew she would be the same sweet, feminine girl he had courted. But in spite of everything he did to appease her, she continued to have her tantrums, and often he thought she acted like one possessed. No one seemed to realize what really possessed her what drove her like a madwoman. It was a passion to get her affairs in order before she had to retire behind doors, to have as much money as possible in case the deluge broke upon her again, to have a stout levy of cash against the rising tide of Yankee hate. Money was the obsession dominating her mind these days. When she thought of the baby at all, it was with baffled rage at the untimeliness of it. Death and taxes and childbirth. There's never any convenient time for... Atlanta had been scandalized enough when Scarlet, a woman, began operating the sawmill. But as time went by, the town decided there was no limit to what she would do. Her sharp trading was shocking especially when her poor mother had been a Robillard, and it was positively indecent the way she kept on going about the streets, when everyone knew she was pregnant. No respectable white woman and few Negroes ever went outside their homes from the moment they first suspected they were with child. And Mrs. Merriweather declared indignantly that from the way Scarlet was acting, she was likely to have the baby on the public streets. But all the previous criticism of her conduct was as nothing compared with the buzz of gossip that now went through the town. Scarlet was not only trafficking with the Yankees, but was giving every appearance of really liking it. Mrs. Merriweather and many other Southerners were also doing business with the newcomers from the North, but the difference was that they didn't like it, and plainly showed they didn't like it. And Scarlet did, or seemed to, which was just as bad. She had actually taken tea with the Yankee officers' wives in their homes. In fact, she had done practically everything short of inviting them into her own home, and the town guessed she would do even that, except for Aunt Pity and Frank. Scarlet knew the town was talking, but she didn't care, couldn't afford to care. She still hated the Yankees with as fierce a hate as on the day when they tried to burn Tara. But she could dissemble that hate. She knew that if she was going to make money, she would have to make it out of the Yankees. And she had learned that buttering them up with smiles and kind words was the surest way to get their business for her mill. Some day when she was very rich and her money was hidden away where the Yankees couldn't find it, then... Then she would tell them exactly what she thought of them, tell them how she hated and loathed and despised them, and what a joy that would be. But until that time came, it was just plain common sense to get along with them. And if that was hypocrisy, let Atlanta make the most of it. She discovered that making friends with the Yankee officers was as easy as shooting birds on the ground. They were lonely exiles in a hostile land, and many of them were starved for polite feminine associations in a town where respectable women drew their skirts aside in passing and looked as if they would like to spit on them. Only the prostitutes and the Negro women had kind words for them. But Scarlet was obviously a lady and a lady of family for all that she worked, 
and they thrilled to her flashing smile and the pleasant light in her green eyes. Frequently, when Scarlet sat in her buggy talking to them and making her dimples play, her dislike for them rose so strong that it was hard not to curse them to their faces. But she restrained herself, and she found that twisting Yankee men around her finger was no more difficult than that same diversion had been with southern men. Only this was no diversion, but a grim business. The role she enacted was that of a refined, sweet southern lady in distress. With an air of dignified reserve, she was able to keep her victims at their proper distance. But there was nevertheless a graciousness in her manner which left a certain warmth in the Yankee officer's memories of Mrs. Kennedy. This warmth was very profitable, as Scarlet had intended it to be. Many of the officers of the garrison, not knowing how long they would be stationed in Atlanta, had sent for their wives and families. As the hotels and boarding houses were overflowing, they were building small houses, and they were glad to buy their lumber from the gracious Mrs. Kennedy, who treated them more politely than anyone else in town. The carpetbaggers and scallowags also, who were building fine homes and stores and hotels with their new wealth, found it more pleasant to do business with her than with the former Confederate soldiers, who were courteous, but with a courtesy more formal and cold than outspoken hate. So, because she was pretty and charming, and could appear quite helpless and forlorn at times, they gladly patronized her lumber yard and also Frank's store, feeling that they should help a plucky little woman who apparently had only a shiftless husband to support her. And Scarlet, watching the business grow, felt that she was safeguarding not only the present with Yankee money, but the future with Yankee friends. Keeping her relations with the Yankee officers on the plane she desired was easier than she expected, for they all seemed to be in awe of southern ladies. But Scarlet soon found that their wives presented a problem she had not anticipated. Contacts with the Yankee women were not of her seeking. She would have been glad to avoid them, but she couldn't, for the officers' wives were determined to meet her. They had an avid curiosity about the South and Southern women, and Scarlet gave them their first opportunity to satisfy it. Other Atlanta women would have nothing to do with them, and even refused to bow to them in church. So when business brought Scarlet to their homes, she was like an answer to prayer. Often, when Scarlet sat in her buggy in front of a Yankee home talking of uprights and shingles with the man of the house, the wife came out to join in the conversation or insist that she come inside for a cup of tea. Scarlet seldom refused, no matter how distasteful the idea might be, for she always hoped to have an opportunity to suggest tactfully that they do their trading at Frank's store. But her self-control was severely tested many times because of the personal questions they asked and because of the smug and condescending attitude they displayed toward all things Southern. Accepting Uncle Tom's cabin as revelation second only to the Bible, the Yankee women all wanted to know about the bloodhounds, which every Southerner kept to track down runaway slaves. And they never believed her when she told them she had only seen one bloodhound in all her life, and it was a small, mild dog and not a huge, ferocious mastiff. They wanted to know about the dreadful branding irons which planters used to mark the faces of their slaves, and the cat-o'-nine-tails with which they beat them to death, and they evidenced what Scarlet felt was a very nasty and ill-bred interest in slave concubinage. Especially did she resent this in view of the enormous increase in mulatto babies in Atlanta since the Yankee soldiers had settled in town. Any other Atlanta woman would have expired in rage at having to listen to such bigoted ignorance, but Scarlet managed to control herself. Assisting her in this was the fact that they aroused her contempt more than her anger. After all, they were Yankees, and no one expected anything better from Yankees. So their unthinking insults to her state her people and their morals, glanced off 
and never struck deep enough to cause her more than a well-concealed sneer. Until an incident occurred which made her sick with rage and showed her, if she needed any showing, how wide was the gap between north and south, and how utterly impossible it was to bridge it. While driving home with Uncle Peter one afternoon, she passed the house into which were crowded the families of three officers who were building their own homes with Scarlet's lumber. The three wives were standing in the walk as she drove by, and they waved to her to stop. Coming out to the carriage block, they greeted her in accents that always made her feel that one could forgive Yankees almost anything except their voices. "'You are just the person I want to see, Mrs. Kennedy,' said a tall, thin woman from Maine. I want to get some information about this benighted town. Scarlet swallowed the insult to Atlanta with the contempt it deserved and smiled her best. And what can I tell you? My nurse, my Bridget, has gone back north. She said she wouldn't stay another day down here among the niggers, as she calls them. And the children are just driving me distracted. Do tell me how to go about getting another nurse. I do not know where to apply. That shouldn't be difficult, said Scarlet, and laughed. If you can find a darky just in from the country who hasn't been spoiled by the Freedmen's Bureau, you'll have the best kind of servant possible. Just stand at your gate here and ask every darky woman who passes, and I'm sure... The three women broke into indignant outcries. Do you think I'd trust my babies to a black nigger? cried the main woman. I want a good Irish girl. I'm afraid you'll find no Irish servants in Atlanta, answered Scarlet, coolness in her voice. Personally, I've never seen a white servant, and I shouldn't care to have one in my house, and she could not keep a slight note of sarcasm from her words. I assure you that darkies aren't cannibals and are quite trustworthy. Goodness, no! I wouldn't have one in my house. The idea! I wouldn't trust them any farther than I could see them, and as for letting them handle my babies... Scarlet thought of the kind, gnarled hands of Mammy worn rough in Ellen's service, and hers, and Wade's. What did these strangers know of black hands? How dear and comforting they could be. How unerringly they knew how to soothe, to pat to fondle. She laughed shortly. It's strange you should feel that way when it was you all who freed them. Lord, not I, dearie, laughed the main woman. I never saw a nigger till I came south last month, and I don't care if I never see another. They give me the creeps. I wouldn't trust one of them. For some moments, Scarlet had been conscious that Uncle Peter was breathing hard and sitting up very straight as he stared steadily at the horse's ears. Her attention was called to him more forcibly when the main woman broke off suddenly with a laugh and pointed him out to her companions. Look at that old nigger swell up like a toad, she giggled. I'll bet he's an old pet of yours, isn't he? You southerners don't know how to treat niggers. You spoil them to death. Peter sucked in his breath, and his wrinkled brow showed deep furrows, but he kept his eyes straight ahead. He had never had the term nigger applied to him by a white person in all his life. By other Negroes, yes, but never by a white person. And to be called untrustworthy and an old pet, he, Peter, who had been the dignified mainstay of the Hamilton family for years. Scarlet felt, rather than saw, the black chin began to shake with hurt pride, and a killing rage swept over her. She had listened with calm contempt while these women had underrated the Confederate army, blackguarded Jeff Davis, and accused Southerners of murder and torture of their slaves. If it were to her advantage, she would have endured insults about her own virtue and honesty. But the knowledge that they had hurt the faithful old darkie with their stupid remarks fired her like a match in gunpowder. For a moment, she looked at the big horse pistol in Peter's belt, and her hands itched for the feel of it. They deserved killing, these insolent, 
ignorant, arrogant conquerors. But she bit down on her teeth until her jaw muscles stood out, reminding herself that the time had not yet come when she could tell the Yankees just what she thought of them. Some day, yes. My God, yes. But not yet. Uncle Peter is one of our family, she said, her voice shaking. Good afternoon. Drive on, Peter. Peter laid the whip on the horse so suddenly that the startled animal jumped forward as the buggy jounced off. Scarlet heard the main woman say with puzzled accents, Her family? You don't suppose she meant a relative? He's exceedingly black. God damn them. They ought to be wiped off the face of the earth. If ever I get money enough, I'll spit in all their faces. I'll... She glanced at Peter and saw that a tear was trickling down his nose. Instantly a passion of tenderness, of grief for his humiliation, swamped her, made her eyes sting. It was as though someone had been senselessly brutal to a child. Those women had hurt Uncle Peter... Peter, who had been through the Mexican War with old Colonel Hamilton. Peter, who had held his master in his arms when he died. Who had raised Melly and Charles and looked after the feckless, foolish Pitypat. Protected her when she refugeed. And quired a horse to bring her back from Macon through a war-torn country after the surrender. And they said they wouldn't trust niggers. Peter, she said, her voice breaking as she put her hand on his thin arm. I'm ashamed of you for crying. What do you care? They aren't anything but damn Yankees. They talked in front of me like I was a mule and couldn't understand them. Like I was a African and didn't know what they was talking about, said Peter, giving a tremendous sniff. And they call me a nigger. And I am, ain't never been called a nigger by no white folks. And they call me an old pet and they say that niggers ain't to be trusted. Me not to be trusted. Why, when the old colonel was dying, he said to me, You, Peter, you looked after my children. Take care of your young Miss Pitypat, he said, because she ain't got no more sense than a hump of grass. And I done take care of her good all these years. Nobody but the angel Gabriel could have done better, said Scarlet soothingly. We just couldn't have lived without you. Yes, sir. Thank you kindly, ma'am. I knows it, and you knows it. But them Yankee folks don't know it, and they don't want to know it. How come they come mixed in in our business, Miss Scarlet? They don't understand us Confederates. Scarlet said nothing, for she was still burning with a wrath she had not exploded in the Yankee women's faces. The two drove home in silence. Peter's sniffle stopped, and his underlip began to protrude gradually until it stuck out alarmingly. His indignation was mounting, now that the initial hurt was subsiding. Scarlet thought, what damnably queer people Yankees are. Those women seemed to think that because Uncle Peter was black, he had no ears to hear with and no feelings, as tender as their own, to be hurt. They didn't know that Negroes had to be handled gently, as though they were children, directed, praised, petted, scolded. They didn't understand Negroes or the relations between the Negroes and their former masters. Yet they had fought a war to free them. And having freed them, they didn't want to have anything to do with them, except to use them to terrorize Southerners. They didn't like them, didn't trust them, didn't understand them. And yet their constant cry was that Southerners didn't know how to get along with them. Not trust a darkie. Scarlet trusted them far more than most white people, certainly more than she trusted any Yankee. 
There were qualities of loyalty and tirelessness and love in them that no strain could break, no money could buy. She thought of the faithful few who remained at Tara in the face of the Yankee invasion when they could have fled or joined the troops for lives of leisure. But they had stayed. She thought of Dilsey toiling in the cotton fields beside her, of Pork risking his life in neighboring hen houses that the family might eat, of Mammy coming to Atlanta with her to keep her from doing wrong. She thought of the servants of her neighbors who had stood loyally beside their white owners, protecting their mistresses while the men were at the front, refugeeing with them through the terrors of the war, nursing the wounded, burying the dead, comforting the bereaved, working, begging, stealing to keep food on the tables. And even now, with the Freedmen's Bureau promising all manner of wonders, they still stuck with their white folks and worked much harder than they ever worked in slave times. But the Yankees didn't understand these things and would never understand them. Yet they set you free, she said aloud. No, ma'am. They didn't set me free. I wouldn't let no such trash set me free, said Peter indignantly. I still belongs to Miss Pity, and when I die she won't lay me in the Hamilton Band ground where I belongs. My miss going to be in a state when I tells her about how you let them Yankee women insult me. I did no such thing, cried Scarlet, startled. You did so, Miss Scarlet, said Peter, pushing out his lip even farther. The point is, neither you nor me had no business being with Yankees, so they could insult me. If you hadn't talked with them, they wouldn't have had no chance to treat me like a mule or an African. And you didn't take up for me, neither. I did, too, said Scarlet, stung by the criticism. Didn't I tell them you were one of the family? That ain't taken up. That's just a fact, said Peter. Miss Scarlet, you ain't got no business having no truck with Yankees. Ain't no other ladies doing it. You wouldn't catch Miss Pity wiping her little shoes on such trash. And she ain't one like it when she hear about what they say about... Peter's criticism hurt worse than anything Frank or Aunt Pity or the neighbors had said. And it so annoyed her she longed to shake the old darky until his toothless gums clapped together. What Peter said was true, but she hated to hear it from a Negro and a family Negro, too. Not to stand high in the opinion of one's servants was as humiliating a thing as could happen to a Southerner. A old pet, Peter grumbled. I specs Miss Pity ain't gwine want me to drive you round no more after that. No, ma'am. Ain't Pity will want you to drive me as usual, she said sternly. So let's hear no more about it. I'll get a misery in my back warned Peter darkly. My back hurt me so bad this minute I can't scarcely sit up. My miss ain't gwine want me to do no driving when I got a misery. Miss Scarlet, it ain't gwine do you no good to stay high with the Yankees and the white trash if your own folks don't prove of you. That was as accurate a summing up of the situation as could be made and Scarlet relapsed into infuriated silence. Yes, the conquerors did approve of her and her family, and her neighbors did not. She knew all the things the town was saying about her, and now even Peter disapproved of her, to the point of not caring to be seen in public with her. That was the last straw. Heretofore she had been careless of public opinion, careless and a little contemptuous, but Peter's words caused fierce resentment to burn in her breast, drove her to a defensive position, made her suddenly dislike her neighbors as much as she disliked the Yankees. Why should they care what I do, she thought. They must think I enjoy associating with Yankees and working like a field hand. They're just making a hard job harder for me. I don't care what they think. I won't let myself care. I can't afford to care now. But some day, 
someday. Oh, someday. When there was security in her world again. Then she would sit back and fold her hands and be a great lady as Ellen had been. She would be helpless and sheltered, as a lady should be, and then everyone would approve of her. Oh, how grand she would be when she had money again. Then she could permit herself to be kind and gentle, as Ellen had been, and thoughtful of other people and of the properties, too. She would not be driven by fears day and night, and life would be a placid, unhurried affair. She would have time to play with their children and listen to their lessons. There would be long, warm afternoons when ladies would call, and amid the rustlings of taffeta petticoats and the rhythmic harsh cracklings of palmetto fans, she would serve tea and delicious sandwiches and cakes and leisurely gossip the hours away. And she would be so kind to those who were suffering misfortune, take baskets to the poor and soup and jelly to the sick, and air those less fortunate in her fine carriage. She would be a lady in the true southern manner, as her mother had been. Then, everyone would love her as they had loved Ellen, and they would say how unselfish she was and call her Lady Bountiful. Her pleasure in these thoughts of the future was undimmed by any realization that she had no real desire to be unselfish or charitable or kind. All she wanted was the reputation for possessing these qualities. But the meshes of her brain were too wide, too coarse, to filter such small differences. It was enough that some day, when she had money, everyone would approve of her. Some day. But not now. Not now, in spite of what anyone might say of her. Now there was no time to be a great lady. Peter was as good as his word. Aunt Pity did get into a state, and Peter's misery developed overnight to such proportions that he never drove the buggy again. Thereafter, Scarlet drove alone, and the calluses which had begun to leave her palms came back again. So the spring months went by, the cool rains of April passing into the warm balm of green May weather. The weeks were packed with work and worry, and the handicaps of increasing pregnancy, with old friends growing cooler and her family increasingly more kind, more maddeningly solicitous, and more completely blind to what was driving her. During those days of anxiety and struggle, there was only one dependable, understanding person in her world, and that person was Rhett Butler. It was odd that he of all people should appear in this light, for he was as unstable as Quicksilver and as perverse as a demon fresh from the pit. But he gave her sympathy, something she had never had from anyone and never expected from him. Frequently he was out of town on those mysterious trips to New Orleans, which he never explained, but which she felt sure, in a faintly jealous way, were connected with a woman, or women. But after Uncle Peter's refusal to drive her, he remained in Atlanta for longer and longer intervals. While in town, he spent most of his time gambling in the rooms above the Girl of the Period Saloon, or in Belle Watling's bar, hobnobbing with the wealthier of the Yankees and carpetbaggers, in money-making schemes which made the townspeople detest him even more than his cronies. He didn't call at the house now, probably in deference to the feelings of Frank and Pity, who would have been outraged at a male caller while Scarlet was in a delicate condition. But she met him by accident almost every day. Time and again... He came riding up to her buggy when she was passing through lonely stretches of Peachtree Road and Decatur Road where the mills lay. He always drew rein and talked, and sometimes he tied his horse to the back of the buggy and drove her on her rounds. She tired more easily these days than she liked to admit, 
and she was always silently grateful when he took the reins. He always left her before they reached the town again, but all Atlanta knew about their meetings, and it gave the gossip something new to add to the long list of Scarlet's affronts to the proprieties. She wondered occasionally if these meetings were not more than accidental. They became more and more numerous as the weeks went by, and as the tension in town heightened over Negro outrages. But why did he seek her out, now of all times, when she looked her worst? Certainly he had no designs upon her, if he had ever had any, and she was beginning to doubt even this. It had been months since he made any joking references to their distressing scene at the Yankee jail. He never mentioned Ashley and her love for him, or made any coarse and ill-bred remarks about coveting her. She thought it best to let sleeping dogs lie, so she didn't ask for an explanation of their frequent meetings. And finally she decided that, because he had little to do besides gamble, and had few enough nice friends in Atlanta, he sought her out solely for companionship's sake. Whatever his reason might be, she found his company most welcome. He listened to her moans about lost customers and bad debts, the swindling ways of Mr. Johnson, and the incompetency of Hugh. He applauded her triumphs, where Frank merely smiled indulgently, and Pity said, Dear me, in a dazed manner. She was sure that he frequently threw business her way, for he knew all the rich Yankees and carpetbaggers intimately. But he always denied being helpful. She knew him for what he was, and she never trusted him. But her spirits always rose with pleasure at the sight of him riding around the curve of a shady road on his big black horse. When he climbed into the buggy and took the reins from her and threw her some impertinent remark, she felt young and gay and attractive again, for all her worries and her increasing bulk. She could talk to him about almost everything, with no care for concealing her motives or her real opinions. And she never ran out of things to say, as she did with Frank, or even with Ashley, if she must be honest with herself. But, of course... In all her conversations with Ashley, there were so many things which could not be said, for honor's sake, that the sheer force of them inhibited other remarks. It was comforting to have a friend like Rhett, now that for some unaccountable reason he had decided to be on good behavior with her. Very comforting, for she had so few friends these days. Rhett! she asked stormily, shortly after Uncle Peter's ultimatum. Why do folks in this town treat me so scurvily and talk about me so? It's a toss-up who they talk worst about, me or the carpetbaggers. I've minded my own business and haven't done anything wrong, and if you haven't done anything wrong, it's because you haven't had the opportunity, and perhaps they dimly realize it. Oh, do be serious. They make me so mad. All I've done is try to make a little money, and all you've done is to be different from other women, and you've made a little success at it. As I've told you before, that is the one unforgivable sin in any society. Be different and be damned. Scarlet, the mere fact that you've made a success of your mill is an insult to every man who hasn't succeeded. Remember... A well-bred female's place is in the home, and she should know nothing about this busy, brutal world. But if I had stayed in my home, I wouldn't have had any home left to stay in. The inference is that you should have starved genteelly and with pride. Oh, fiddle-dee! But look at Mrs. Merriweather. She's selling pies to Yankees, and that's worse than running a sawmill. Mrs. Elsing takes in sewing and keeps borders, and Fanny paints awful-looking china things that nobody wants, and everybody buys to help her, and... But you miss the point, my pet. They aren't successful, and so they aren't affronting the hot southern pride of their men folks. The men can still say, poor sweet sillies, how hard they try. Well, I'll let them think they're helping. And besides, the ladies you mentioned don't enjoy having to work. 
They let it be known that they're only doing it until some man comes along to relieve them of their unwomanly burdens. And so everybody feels sorry for them. But obviously, you do like to work. And obviously, you aren't going to let any man tend to your business for you, and so no one can feel sorry for you. And Atlanta is never going to forgive you for that. It's so pleasant to feel sorry for people. I wish you'd be serious sometimes. Did you ever hear the Oriental proverb, The dogs bark, but the caravan passes on? Let them bark, Scarlet. I fear nothing will stop your caravan. But why should they mind my making a little money? You can't have everything, Scarlet. You can either make money in your present unladylike manner and meet cold shoulders everywhere you go, or you can be poor and genteel and have lots of friends. You've made your choice. I won't be poor, she said swiftly, but it is the right choice, isn't it? If it's money you want most. Yes, I want money more than anything else in the world. Then you've made the only choice. But there's a penalty attached, as there is to most things you want. It's loneliness. That silenced her for a moment. When she stopped to think about it, she was a little lonely. Lonely for feminine companionship. During the war years, she had had Ellen to visit when she felt blue. And since Ellen's death, there had always been Melanie though she and Melanie had nothing in common except the hard work at Terra. Now there was no one, for Aunt Pity had no conception of life beyond her small round of gossip. I think, I think, she began hesitantly, that I've always been lonely where women were concerned. It isn't just my working that makes Atlanta ladies dislike me. They just don't like me anyway. No woman ever really liked me, except Mother, even my sisters. I don't know why. But even before the war, even before I married Charlie, ladies didn't seem to approve of anything I did. You forget Mrs. Wilkes, said Rhett, and his eyes gleamed maliciously. She has always approved of you up to the hilt. I dare say she'd approve of anything you did, short of murder. Scarlet thought grimly. She's even approved of murder. And she laughed contemptuously. Oh, Melly, she said, and then ruefully. It's certainly not to my credit that Melly's the only woman who approves of me, for she hasn't the sense of a guinea hen. If she had any sense, she stopped in some confusion. If she had any sense, she'd realize a few things, and she couldn't approve. Rhett finished. Well, you know more about that than I do, of course. Oh, damn your memory and your bad manners. I'll pass over your unjustified rudeness with the silence it deserves, and return to our former subject. Make up your mind to this. If you are different, you are isolated not only from people of your own age, but from those of your parents' generation, and from your children's generation, too. They'll never understand you. And they'll be shocked no matter what you do. But your grandparents would probably be proud of you and say, there's a chip off the old block. And your grandchildren will sigh enviously and say, what an old rip grandma must have been. And they'll try to be like you. Scarlet laughed with amusement. Sometimes you do hit on the truth. Now, there was my Grandma Robillard. Mammy used to hold her over my head whenever I was naughty. Grandma was as cold as an icicle and strict about her manners and everybody else's manners, but she married three times and had any number of duels fought over her, and she wore rouge and the most shockingly low-cut dresses and no... Well, er... Uh, not much under her dresses. And you admired her tremendously for all that you tried to be like your mother. I had a grandfather on the butler side who was a pirate. Not really. A walk-the-plank kind? 
I dare say he made people walk the plank if there was any money to be made that way. At any rate, he made enough money to leave my father quite wealthy. But the family always referred to him carefully as a sea captain. He was killed in a saloon brawl long before I was born. His death was, needless to say, a great relief to his children, for the old gentleman was drunk most of the time, and when in his cups was apt to forget that he was a retired sea captain and give reminiscences that curled his children's hair. However, I admired him and tried to copy him far more than I ever did my father. For father is an amiable gentleman full of honorable habits and pious saws. So you see how it goes. I'm sure your children won't approve of you, Scarlet, any more than Mrs. Merriweather and Mrs. Elsing and their broods approve of you now. Your children will probably be soft, prissy creatures, as the children of hard-bitten characters usually are. And to make them worse, you, like every other mother, are probably determined that they shall never know the hardships you've known. And that's all wrong. Hardships make or break people. So you'll have to wait for approval from your grandchildren. I wonder what our grandchildren will be like. Are you suggesting that by our, that you and I will have mutual grandchildren? Fine, Mrs. Kennedy. Scarlet suddenly conscious of her error in speech, went red. It was more than his joking words that shamed her, for she was suddenly aware again of her thickening body. In no way had either of them ever hinted at her condition, and she had always kept the lap-robe high under her armpits when with him, even on warm days, comforting herself in the usual feminine manner with a belief that she didn't show at all when thus covered. And she was suddenly sick with quick rage at her own condition, and shame that he should know. You get out of this buggy, you dirty-minded varmint, she said, her voice shaking. I'll do nothing of the kind, he returned calmly. It'll be dark before you get home, and there's a new colony of darkies living in tents and shanties near the next spring. Mean niggers, I've been told. And I see no reason why you should give the impulsive Ku Klux a cause for putting on their nightshirts and riding abroad this evening. Get out, she cried, tugging at the reins, and suddenly nausea overwhelmed her. He stopped the horse quickly. The afternoon sun, slanting low through the newly-leaved trees, spun sickeningly for a few moments in a swirl of golden green. When the spell had passed... She put her head in her hands and cried from sheer mortification. Not only had she vomited before a man, in itself as horrible a contretemps as could overtake a woman, but by doing so, the humiliating fact of her pregnancy must now be evident. She felt that she could never look him in the face again. To have this happen with him, of all people, with Rhett, who had no respect for women. She cried, expecting some coarse and jocular remark from him, which she would never be able to forget. Don't be a fool, he said quietly. And you are a fool if you're crying for shame. Come, Scarlet, don't be a child. Surely you must know that not being blind, I knew you were pregnant. She said, Oh, in a stunned voice, and tightened her fingers over her crimson face. The word itself horrified her. Frank always referred to her pregnancy embarrassedly as your condition. Gerald had been wont to say delicately in the family way. When he had to mention such matters... And ladies genteelly referred to pregnancy as being in a fix. You are a child if you thought I didn't know, for all your smothering yourself under that hot lap robe. Of course I knew. Why else do you think I've been? He stopped suddenly, and a silence fell between them. He picked up the reins and clucked to the horse. He went on talking quietly, 
and as his drawl fell pleasantly on her ears, some of the color faded from her down-tucked face. I didn't think you could be so shocked, Scarlet. I thought you were a sensible person, and I'm disappointed. Can it be possible that modesty still lingers in your breast? I'm afraid I'm not a gentleman to have mentioned the matter, and I know I'm not a gentleman in view of the fact that pregnant women do not embarrass me as they should. I find it possible to treat them as normal creatures and not look at the ground or the sky or anywhere else in the universe except their waistlines and then cast at them those furtive glances I've always thought the height of indecency. Why should I? It's a perfectly normal state. The Europeans are far more sensible than we are. They compliment expectant mothers upon their expectations. While I wouldn't advise going that far, still it's more sensible than our way of trying to ignore it. It's a normal state, and women should be proud of it, instead of hiding behind closed doors as if they'd committed a crime. Proud? She cried in a strangled voice. Proud? Ugh! Aren't you proud to be having a child? Oh, dear God, no. I... I hate babies. You mean Frank's baby? No. Anybody's baby. For a moment she went sick again at this new error of speech. But his voice went on as easily as though he had not marked it. Then we're different. I like babies. You like them? She cried, looking up so startled at the statement that she forgot her embarrassment. What a liar you are! I like babies, and I like little children. Till they begin to grow up and acquire adult habits of thought, and adult abilities to lie and cheat and be dirty. That can't be news to you. You know I like Wade Hampton a lot, for all that he isn't the boy he ought to be. That was true, thought Scarlet suddenly marveling. He did seem to enjoy playing with Wade and often brought him presents. Now that we've brought this dreadful subject into the light and you admit that you expect a baby sometime in the not-too-distant future, I'll say something I've been wanting to say for weeks. Two things. The first is that it's dangerous for you to drive alone. You know it. You've been told it often enough. If you don't care personally whether or not you're raped, you might consider the consequences. Because of your obstinacy, you may get yourself into a situation where your gallant fellow townsmen will be forced to avenge you by stringing up a few darkies. And that will bring the Yankees down on them, and someone will probably get hanged. Has it ever occurred to you that perhaps one of the reasons the ladies do not like you is that your conduct may cause the neck stretching of their sons and husbands? And furthermore, if the Ku Klux handles many more Negroes, the Yankees are going to tighten up on Atlanta in a way that will make Sherman's conduct look angelic. I know what I'm talking about. For I'm hand in glove with the Yankees. Shameful to state. They treat me as one of them, and I hear them talk openly. They mean to stamp out the Ku Klux if it means burning the whole town again and hanging every male over ten. That would hurt you, Scarlet. You might lose money. And there's no telling where a prairie fire will stop once it gets started. Confiscation of property, higher taxes, fines for suspected women. I've heard them all suggested. The Ku Klux... Do you know any of the Ku Klux? Is Tommy Wellburn or Hugh or... He shrugged impatiently. How should I know? I'm a renegade, a turncoat, a scalawag. Would I be likely to know? But I do know men who are suspected by the Yankees and one false move from them and they're as good as hanged. Well, I know you would have no regrets at getting your neighbors on the gallows. I do believe you'd regret losing your mills. I see by the stubborn look on your face that you do not believe me and my words are falling on stony ground. So all I can say is keep that pistol of yours handy. And when I'm in town, I'll try to be on hand to drive you. Brett, do you really... Is it to protect me that you... Yes, my dear. 
It is my much-advertised chivalry that makes me protect you. The mocking light began to dance in his black eyes, and all signs of earnestness fled from his face. And why? Because of my deep love for you, Mrs. Kennedy. Yes, I have silently hungered and thirsted for you and worshipped you from afar, but being an honorable man, like Mr. Ashley Wilkes, I have concealed it from you. You are, alas, Frank's wife, and honor has forbidden my telling this to you. But even as Mr. Wilkes' honor cracks occasionally, so mine is cracking now, and I reveal my secret passion and my— Oh, for God's sake, hush! interrupted Scarlet, annoyed as usual when he made her look like a conceited fool, and not caring to have Ashley and his honor become the subject of further conversation. What was the other thing you wanted to tell me? What? You changed the subject when I am bearing a loving but lacerated heart? Well, the other thing is this. The mocking light died out of his eyes again, and his face was dark and quiet. I want you to do something about this horse. He's stubborn, and he's got a mouth as tough as iron. Tires you to drive him, doesn't it? Well, if he chose to bolt, you couldn't possibly stop him. And if you turned over in a ditch, it might kill your baby and you too. You ought to get the heaviest curb bit you can, or else let me swap him for a gentle horse with a more sensitive mouth. She looked up into his blank, smooth face. And suddenly her irritation fell away, even as her embarrassment had disappeared after the conversation about her pregnancy. He had been kind a few moments before, to put her at her ease when she was wishing that she were dead. And he was being kinder now, and very thoughtful about the horse. She felt a rush of gratitude to him, and she wondered why he couldn't always be this way. The horse is hard to drive, she agreed meekly. Sometimes my arms ache all night from tugging at him. You do what you think best about him, Rhett. His eyes sparkled wickedly. That sounds very sweet and feminine, Mrs. Kennedy. Not in your usual masterful vein at all. Well, it only takes proper handling to make a clinging vine out of you. She scowled, and her temper came back. You will get out of this buggy this time, or I will hit you with a whip. I don't know why I put up with you, why I try to be nice to you. You have no manners, you have no morals, you are nothing but a... Well, get out. I mean it. But when he had climbed down and untied his horse from the back of the buggy and stood in the twilight road grinning tantalizingly at her. She couldn't smother her own grin as she drove off. Yes, he was coarse. He was tricky. He was unsafe to have dealings with. And you never could tell when the dull weapon you put into his hands in an unguarded moment might turn into the keenest of blades. But after all, he was as stimulating as... Well as a surreptitious glass of brandy. During these months, Scarlet had learned the use of brandy. When she came home in the late afternoons, damp from the rain, cramped and aching from long hours in the buggy, nothing sustained her except the thought of the bottle hidden in her top bureau drawer, locked against Mammy's prying eyes. Dr. Mead had not thought to warn her that a woman in her condition shouldn't drink for it never occurred to him that a decent woman would drink anything stronger than scuppernong wine. Except, of course, a glass of champagne at a wedding, or a hot toddy when confined to bed with a hard cold. Of course, there were unfortunate women who drank, to the eternal disgrace of their families, just as there were women who were insane or divorced, or who believed, with Miss Susan B. Anthony, that women should have the vote. But as much as the doctor disapproved of Scarlet, he never suspected her of drinking. Scarlet had found that a drink of neat brandy before supper helped immeasurably, and she could always chew coffee or gargle cologne to disguise the smell. 
Why were people so silly about women drinking? When men could, and did get reeling drunk whenever they wanted to. Sometimes when Frank lay snoring beside her and sleep wouldn't come. When she lay tossing, torn with fears of poverty, dreading the Yankees. Homesick for Tara and yearning for Ashley. She thought she would go crazy were it not for the brandy bottle. And when the pleasant, familiar warmth stole through her veins, her troubles began to fade. After three drinks, she could always say to herself, I'll think of these things tomorrow, when I can stand them better. But there were some nights when even Brandy wouldn't still the ache in her heart. The ache that was even stronger than fear of losing the mills. The ache to see Tara again. Atlanta, with its noises, its new buildings, its strange faces, its narrow streets crowded with horses and wagons and bustling crowds, sometimes seemed to stifle her. She loved Atlanta, but, oh, for the sweet peace and country quiet of Terra, the red fields and the dark pines about it. Oh, to be back at Terra, no matter how hard the life might be, and to be near Ashley, just to see him, to hear him speak, to be sustained by the knowledge of his love. Each letter from Melanie saying that they were well. Each brief note from Will reporting about the plowing, the planting, the growing of the cotton made her long anew to be home again. I'll go home in June. I can't do anything here after that. I'll go home for a couple of months, she thought, and her heart would rise. She did go home in June, but not as she longed to go. For early in that month, came a brief message from Will that Gerald was dead. Chapter 39 The train was very late, and the long, deeply blue twilight of June was settling over the countryside when Scarlet alighted in Jonesboro. Yellow gleams of lamplight showed in the stores and houses which remained in the village, but they were few. Here and there were wide gaps between the buildings on the main street where dwellings had been shelled or burned. Ruined houses with shell holes in their roofs and half the walls torn away stared at her, silent and dark. A few saddle horses and mule teams were hitched outside the wooden awning of Bullard's store. The dusty red road was empty and lifeless and the only sounds in the village were a few whoops and drunken laughs that floated on the still twilight air from a saloon far down the street. The depot had not been rebuilt since it was burned in the battle, and in its place was only a wooden shelter with no sides to keep out the weather. Scarlet walked under it and sat down on one of the empty kegs that were evidently put there for seats. She peered up and down the street for Will Benteen, Will should have been here to meet her. He should have known she would take the first train possible after receiving his laconic message that Gerald was dead. She had come so hurriedly that she had in her small carpet bag only a nightgown and a toothbrush, not even a change of underwear. She was uncomfortable in the tight black dress she had borrowed from Mrs. Mead, for she had had no time to get morning clothes for herself. Mrs. Mead was thin now, and Scarlet's pregnancy being advanced, the dress was doubly uncomfortable. Even in her sorrow at Gerald's death, she didn't forget the appearance she was making, and she looked down at her body with distaste. Her figure was completely gone, and her face and ankles were puffy. Heretofore she had not cared very much how she looked, but now that she would see Ashley within the hour, she cared greatly. Even in her heartbreak... She shrank from the thought of facing him when she was carrying another man's child. She loved him, and he loved her. And this unwanted child now seemed to her a proof of infidelity to that love. But much as she disliked having him see her with the slenderness gone from her waist and the lightness from her step, it was something she couldn't escape now. She patted her foot impatiently. Will should have met her. 
Of course, she could go over to Bullard's and inquire after him, or ask someone there to drive her over to Tara, should she find he had been unable to come. But she didn't want to go to Bullard's. It was Saturday night, and probably half the men of the county would be there. She didn't want to display her condition in this poorly fitting black dress, which accentuated rather than hid her figure. She didn't want to hear the kindly sympathy that would be poured out about Gerald. She didn't want sympathy. She was afraid she would cry if anyone even mentioned his name to her. And she wouldn't cry. She knew if she once began, it would be like the time she cried into the horse's mane, that dreadful night when Atlanta fell and Rhett had left her on the dark road outside the town. Terrible tears that tore her heart and couldn't be stopped. No, she wouldn't cry. She felt the lump in her throat rising again as it had done so often since the news came. But crying wouldn't do any good. It would only confuse and weaken her. Why? Oh, why hadn't Will or Melanie or the girls written her that Gerald was ailing? She would have taken the first train to Tara to care for him, brought a doctor from Atlanta if necessary, the fools, all of them. Couldn't they manage anything without her? She couldn't be in two places at once, and the good Lord knew she was doing her best for them all in Atlanta. She twisted about on the keg, becoming nervous and fidgety, as Will still didn't come. Where was he? Then she heard the scrunching of cinders on the railroad tracks behind her, and, twisting her body, she saw Alex Fontaine crossing the tracks toward a wagon, a sack of oats on his shoulder. Good Lord! "'Isn't that you, Scarlet?' he cried, dropping the sack and running to take her hand, pleasure written all over his bitter, swarthy little face. "'I'm so glad to see you. I saw Will over at the blacksmith shop, getting the horse shod. The train was late and he thought he'd have time. Shall I run and fetch him?' "'Yes, please, Alex,' she said, smiling in spite of her sorrow. "'It was good to see a county face again. "'Oh, um, Scarlet,' He began awkwardly, still holding her hand. I'm mighty sorry about your father. Thank you, she replied, wishing he had not said it. His words brought up Gerald's florid face and bellowing voice so clearly. If it's any comfort to you, Scarlet, we're mighty proud of him around here. Alex continued, dropping her hand. He, well, we figure he died like a soldier and in a soldier's cause. Now what did he mean by that, she thought confusedly. A soldier? Had someone shot him? Had he gotten into a fight with the scallywags as Tony had? But she mustn't hear more. She would cry if she talked about him, and she mustn't cry, not until she was safely in the wagon with Will and out in the country where no stranger could see her. Will wouldn't matter. He was like a brother. Alex, I don't want to talk about it, she said shortly. I don't blame you one bit, Scarlet, said Alex, while the dark blood of anger flooded his face. If it was my sister, I'd... Well, Scarlet, I've never yet said a harsh word about any woman, but personally I think somebody ought to take a rawhide whip to Sue Ellen. What foolishness was he talking about now, she wondered. What had Sue Ellen to do with it all? Everybody around here feels the same way about her, I'm sorry to say. Will's the only one who takes up for her, and, of course, Miss Melanie, but she's a saint and won't see bad in anyone. And I said I didn't want to talk about it, she said coldly, but Alex didn't seem rebuffed. He looked as though he understood her rudeness, and that was annoying. She didn't want to hear bad tidings about her own family from an outsider, didn't want him to know of her ignorance of what had happened. Why hadn't Will sent her the full details? She wished Alex wouldn't look at her so hard. She felt that he realized her condition and it embarrassed her. But what Alex was thinking as he peered at her in the twilight was that her face had changed so completely. He wondered how he had ever recognized her. Perhaps it was because she was going to have a baby. Women did look like the devil at such times. And, of course, she must be feeling badly about old man O'Hara. She had been his pet. But no, the change was deeper than that. She really looked better 
than when he had seen her last. At least, she now looked as if she had three square meals a day, and the hunted animal look had partly gone from her eyes. Now the eyes which had been fearful and desperate were hard. There was an air of command, assurance and determination about her, even when she smiled. But she led old Frank a merry life. Yes, she had changed. She was a handsome woman, to be sure, but all that pretty, sweet softness had gone from her face, and that flattering way of looking up at a man, like he knew more than God Almighty, had utterly vanished. Well, hadn't they all changed? Alex looked down at his rough clothes, and his face fell into its usual bitter lines. Sometimes at night, when he lay awake, wondering how his mother was going to get that operation, and how poor dead Joe's little boy was going to get an education, and how he was going to get money for another mule. He wished the war was still going on, wished it had gone on forever, 